Uh, this is really an epic journey of humanity because for the first time in the history of mankind, we have the knowledge, both engineering, scientific, and business knowledge to be able to start reaching to the stars for many of the things that human beings need uh, to be effective and to be happy. And uh, so to be on this journey and to be the activists, if you will, helping people understand what this can mean it is just a joy. And uh, that's why I'm so grateful to be a part of this. And there are innovation patents that are waiting to come to market to create that next billion or trillion dollar economy. And we need to look for that workforce where we may have not thought of them in the inner cities, in rural communities, minorities, women, veterans, retirees. We have the workforce we need for the space economy. We just have to reach out and let them know that they can be part of this community. What we want for Mars Point for every, it to be democratic, for anyone to be able to mine it. And so it's very easy to get a hold of one of these. Uh, this is called a future bit Apollo uh, Moonlander 2 USB key. But there's a lot of wide variety of basic hardware that's available. And we're even talking about uh, making our algorithm even easier so you can mine it on a, on a, a smartphone or a computer. Space and some other niche markets we found gave us the ability to make revenue, bring in some business to show we can execute, to also mature manufacturing so we know what the yields look like and the, st the stats. There is a misunderstanding that just because we are talking about space, it's all about wonderful cooperation. Yeah. That is what we aspire Bring for and we hope for. Send it in but if you look at the <laughs> programs, for example, uh, China and Russia space program, Turkey, for example, uh, India to an extent as well, these are very nationalistic space programs. Yeah. And so China, what it has very cleverly done is that it has actually established a uh, Belt and Road Space Information Corridor in the last few years. And this is President Xi's thinking in terms of institutionalizing the Communist Party of China. Andy talks about risk in a couple different ways. I've been... <laughs> <laughs> that's my car. <laughs> Go on. Oh my God, that's epic. Uh, it's still wrong, but it's, it's epic. <laughs> Space Force TM, uh, trademark oh, for Netflix, I think is a damn funny show. Your character is played by John Malkovich. Like, that guy is you. Who has a much better oratory style and a much better word room than I do, by the way. <laughs> um, and to me, when, when we're ready to use a certain technology, a certain thing, not just for solving problems, but also for the expression of our very being and in who we are. I, I think that's one of the markers that that technology has arrived. Like it, it's now something that helps us talk about who we are, not just solve the problems we have. The big money maker is probably in the near term going to be uh, the, the backlog of space tourism that we're seeing. And so this is nothing to do with a government program. This is commercial companies making commercial, you know, doing commerce in, in the private sector, which has been um, really looked down upon in the news, but um, I think it's kind of exciting. This is our opportunity to, to build a future where we take this journey into the economy of space and do it responsibly as a human race. I think we can get there, but I think we got to be smarter than we were in the past. And this is where we want to get to. This is what the next plaque needs to say instead of we came in peace for all mankind. <laughs> we came in profit for all mankind. Good morning, y'all. 
thanks for thanks for being with us this morning uh looking looking forward to the day um It's going to be an interesting it's going to be an interesting day as as was yesterday uh let me pull up my notes here give me 10 seconds um you know yesterday it was yesterday was terrific uh so we really want to thank our uh speakers and sponsors and and my terrific team um uh you know we had we had a kind of a normal programming where we talk about the uh, grand architecture and the starship singularity. That's always something important to talk about. Um, we brought in Professor Hanlon, Michelle Hanlon uh, with National Space Society. She's the president of National Space Society, but also um, she's a professor at University of Mississippi, Old Miss. And she is the co-founder of For All Mankind. So we had a really interesting conversation with her about, um, about the kinds of laws and policies that need to be in place for all of these spaceflight participants, tourists, uh, citizen astronauts, call it how you like. Um, there's no, there are no rules in place for them. Uh, so she brought in a really interesting topic that uh, that says, you know, if somebody spills coffee uh, or or spills milk, uh, that was her phrase, that was her example. Um, somebody's lactose intolerant and they drink milk on a uh, private space station, who do you sue? Uh, which is something that I had never considered, right? Um, and, and now, uh, in, in the United States, if you spill hot coffee on yourself at McDonald's, um, you sue McDonald's. I mean, I think that's terrible and silly and stupid, but that's what happens. Whereas if you do the same thing, if the exact same scenario happens in space, you get to sue the space station company, the lifting, uh, launching company and the United States, if it launched from the United States. So uh the united states government's on the hook so it's really crazy what the regime looks like so pretty interesting conversation about um uh uh pretty interesting conversation about the uh uh the state of the world uh, and and the and the legal perspectives uh, then Laura Forsett came on board and she talked for just a whirlwind of 30 minutes uh, describing some of the updates in the field of space stations. Uh, it's a personal passion of hers. She was a part of the crew managing what equipment, what experiments went to the International Space Station. It was an organization called CASIS. Um, and it's the group that manages the national lab component of, the, of uh, the International Space Station. So it's always a treat to have her come in and review all of the news that happens. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, it was really, it was a really interesting review of all the things that had been happening. Uh, she pointed out something that's gonna happen today. Um, the uh, director of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, uh, is gonna make an announcement about their um, participation in the International Space Station going forward. So we'll see how that goes. That's gonna get very political, very fast. Um, hopefully we'll get an update on that today. Maybe that's gonna be next month. Um, then Dallas Beanhoff came in and talked about his reusable cisgender architecture. That was a terrific conversation because um, there are giant inefficiencies in the systems that are being designed right now to go to the moon, um, specifically to go to the moon, but also the entire cisgender ecosphere. How, how are we managing that? 
um, what assets, what, are, uh, what infrastructure are we gonna have for that? Uh, then I talked a little bit about space elevators, more specifically about Liftport Group, uh, who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and then we closed out the day with uh, Dr. Jofstrat from Sweden, calling in from Sweden. He's recently purchased uh, a very large uh, old schoolhouse. Um, it's large. I don't know what it is. Maybe maybe 70,000, 80,000 uh, square feet. I'm not sure what that is in meters. And um, that's pretty amazing because uh, he's turning it into a lunar analog site, a lunar analog uh, location. So he's going to be doing things like... Um, uh, growing bananas, trying to look at manufacturing processes. How do we build things on the lunar surface? And, and the only way to do that is um, use the equipment, use the materials that are already there. So uh, yeah, it was a pretty fascinating conversation. And then we ended with uh, a full 75 minutes with Rick Tomlinson. He he is the founder, he's one of three co-founders of the Space Frontier Foundation. Uh, I think that's one of the more pivotal organizations in the whole space industry, um, especially the commercialization sector. Uh, but he told the inside story of the development of Mir Corp and the first, the very first commercial space station. It's a story that most people don't know. Some of it is told through uh, the, the, the DVD documentary, Orphans of Apollo. Um, but most of this was new, even though I've, uh, um, even though I've been you know, around this area for a long time, um, it, it was still a lot of new information. So that was, uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, it was strange because I, I really thought that, um, uh, I really thought I knew the story pretty well. Um, uh, but, but no, I, I really didn't. It was, uh, there was a lot of new stuff there, a lot of new stuff there. Um, so that, that kind of rounded out the day. Um, and that kind of set the tone for today. Um, uh, what we're doing today is really talking about babies on orbit, children, children in space. And that's one of those things that just, it's just, it's not talked about. We don't, we don't know this stuff. Um, and, and my contention, what I've been saying for a while now is that um, it's the Holy grail problem in space. It's the, uh, it's the um, hardest, maybe it's the most important problem in space that if we can't figure out how to have kids on orbit, uh, the, the only thing we're doing is, is camping up there. Um, and that's great. I'm, I'm all for camping. I'm all for going to the International Space Station for 20 years in a row. Um, that's, that's amazing. I think that's, that's awesome. Um, but if we can't figure out how to have kids on orbit, then all we're really doing is, is camping. Um, and then we have got uh, a terrific surprise guest. So uh, my friend Peter Gerritsen was able to join us at the last minute. Um, so thank you for Peter for, for joining us quickly. Um, I'll bring you on in just a moment. The, as most of y'all know that the way this works is um, most of the first day is really talking about hardware and business in space. Most of the second day is uh, about babies, children on orbit, and also uh, policy and outreach and things like that. So 
Um, we've asked uh, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Peter Garretson to join us uh, and give us his perspective kind of from the, the think tank world of Washington, D.C. with the brand new uh, budget that was just just released a, a few days ago. Uh, not sorry, I, I don't want to say that re released. I'm, I'm saying that wrong. Um, the Biden administration's proposal to Congress. Uh, that's it's not a it's not a confirmed budget yet, but still, it's it's pretty exciting that that's going to be uh, that that might be the new marching orders. Um, let me uh, uh, let me bring on Peter. Just give me ten seconds here. Um, Okay. Minor, uh, minor logistics stuff happening in the background here. Just give me a second. And Peter, come on board, sir. Thank you very much for being here. I'm looking forward to chatting. Thanks for kind of a uh, uh, last minute addition to the schedule. I'm grateful. Well, thank you so much. How are you doing this morning? Uh, good. You're very quiet. Let me see if I can turn you up a little bit. Sound check, please. How do you hear me now? Loud and clear. Five by five. Thanks, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. You're out in uh, Colorado Springs now? I am. Nice. This week, anyway. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing out there? I mean, I know what you're doing, but tell us what, we're, what you're doing out there. So uh, first, I'm going to uh, spend some time at Space Generation Advisory Council, and then I'll be there for the Space Symposium, cool. which is part of the, uh, uh, the really big space event, particularly for government folks and established industry. Cool. That's great. That's terrific. So uh, big news. I mean, I think it's big news. Um, uh, the Biden administration requested a whole lot of new money for space. Um, first, you know, for background, what does uh, what does uh, for background? What 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 is what is the um, budget process look like? Why is, why is this document such a big deal? Like, let's start there. Before we dig into the document itself, let's, let's talk about why it exists and how it works its way through the halls of power. All right, so this is the president's transmittal of, of their request for the budget, meaning what does the administration think is the appropriate funding for various agencies and various projects that has already come through a, a long uh, build in the various departments and agencies, and then has been sort of fought it out with the priorities of the administration, and in particular, the Office of Management and Budget, who then sends a consolidated package to Congress as far as where they think they should spend the executive and discretionary part of the budget. Congress will then to have their own take on it, since they're the ones who actually control the, uh, the budget purse strings, this can be seen as more or less you know, a suggestion or a starting place. The authorizers then go through and decide what they think is appropriate that you can legally spend money on. And then the appropriators will actually appropriate money for those things that have been authorized. And those don't always agree. So typically what will happen is the president will put forward the budget that they think is appropriate. Congress will make their tweaks, plussing up things they think uh, have been left out or are important or might be important to individual members in, you know, in, if, you know, for their districts. Sometimes that's seen as pork, other times that's you know, amending the, uh, the lack of vision at the top for small disruptive things. And then eventually you'll have an executed budget as for instance, we just had you know, last month or so that, uh, you know, that actually provides a budget that can be executed. And of course, if this all doesn't happen according to schedule, which it has not for the past few years, 
then all agencies and departments you know, usually operate, Congress will pass what's called a continuing resolution, which means you can only spend on at, at the same level of the things that you were doing last year. And so that really hurts agencies when they want to do anything new. So new starts are not allowed under a continuing resolution. And then, you know, it causes a train wreck if and when the final budget passes, because then you've got to try to hurry up and execute. And so in particular, in our industry, in the space industry, where so much of what's meaningful and happening is in small companies, you can literally destroy a small company by a small delay in funding. Yeah, I've seen that over and over again, um, you know, with my, with my own organization and other friends of mine in the industry that have had real troubles. So, um, yeah, we, we're not a big fan of continuing resolutions. So, so this document came out. So what, why is this thing significant? And especially then that uh, Congress just passed um, funding just a few weeks ago, that's gonna run out what, I think October, is that right? I, I'm not sure to be honest. Okay. I did not look at that. I thought that they had actually finally passed what they needed to pass um, because there was a you know strong enactment of, uh, of what was gonna be you know, in the budget for the year. Um, some of which is some really good stuff for this past year. Yeah. In, in particular, you know, two things that Congress put in uh, is an accelerate cis lunar for the Department of Defense and a funding for uh, nuclear thermal, sorry, for nuclear propulsion uh, in cis lunar. Um, you know, I think 60 and 71 million respectively, right? So this, that really represents the vision of Congress to make sure that we are uh, moving out in cislunar does not unfortunately reflect, uh, you know, visions inside uh, the executive branch. But all right, so let's talk about this, this budget and the good and bad of the budget, right? So as space people, we would, we would conceivably be uh, concerned about a, a number of things. Um, you know, mostly we're going to be concerned about what's happening in NASA and the Space Force, but we might peripherally be, you know, concerned with anything that uh, relates to, you know, innovation and technology that supports space. So we could be interested in, for instance, what DOE is doing or what the intelligence community level of resources for space are. Right. But I'm going to, you know, concentrate principally on you know what this budget is doing in general for uh, you know for innovation funding in space. So, what I would first say is that if we were not experiencing the high rate of inflation that we are, uh, the numbers on this budget would represent you know a, a significant increase for both uh, NASA and um, the Space Force. Yeah. Unfortunately. With the actual uh, rate of inflation that we have now, this probably represents reduced buying power over this year for next year. Wow, I had not actually considered that. That's interesting. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, for NASA, you know, they are, they are treading water. I think they got, you know, on the order of a 8% increase, but inflation is 7%. And, uh, and the DOD, you know, got a, well, it appears they got a substantial increase, but I'll talk about why that's not actually the case. Um, but, uh, or, or at least it appears that the Space Force has a substantially larger budget. Um, but in reality, you know, it, it's probably actually slightly smaller in terms of actual buying power. Wow. But <clears throat> there, there are still some, you know, good things. So on the NASA side, um, you know, we, have, we are at least not undermining our current vector, right? They've, they've put additional money, uh, an additional 1.5 billion into the human landing system. And, you know, that is significant. Um, you know, they, they are continuing uh, a slight uptake from 4.5 to 4.7 billion for 
what they call the common exploration system or what we, you know, we in the community typically call it SLS. And, um, and then a number of things, you know, seem like they're going to be delayed. It looks like OSAM1 is going to be delayed. It looks like the uh, NEO survey is going to be delayed. There's a slight uptick for climate from 2.3 to 2.4 billion. Um, um, quite a bit on aeronautics. Aeronautics got nearly a billion more. Um, to That's use. mostly green, uh, yeah. green flight, green fuel, green right. operation, and a little bit of drones, right? That's how I was looking at that. Yeah, it's it seems mostly to reduce the climate impact of, of aviation. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's that's consistent, you know, with the administration, you know, but but we should talk about like why are you know, despite the fact that it is a larger budget, you know, it is 26 billion uh, this year, you know, why are space enthusiasts in general not not enthusiastic about it? Why are they not excited? Well. You know, basically, because it it's it's mostly a continuation of the past, right? It's as if this budget completely ignores everything going on in the community, right? It's ignoring. Uh, it's not completely ignoring Starship because, of course, it's funding you know part of it for the HLS, right? But it's ignoring Starship as an Earth to orbit you know, pathbreaker that, that, you know, is a game changer, right? It's ignoring the, you know, the repeated interest of Congress in wanting to have clarity about lunar industrialization, the lunar industrial facility, things leading to settlement. Uh, it's not making the investments in the, the fundamental things that are going to, you know, matter. There's no rotating habitat, you know, there's, there's not some neat new, you know, space agriculture, you know, uh, direction. It's, it's, you know, still soft, still very, very small on ISRU, still soft and small on in-space manufacturing. These are, these are not major parts, right? There's not a major investment and push for nuclear thermal propulsion that would, you know, in, enable things. So, you know, on the on what we in the community would consider to be the big ticket items, you know, these are really small potatoes. Small potatoes for, uh, you know, for private space stations. You know, small potatoes for the the really disruptive things that are going on. Right. I mean, you do have the clips landers, right? But it's still small dollars. Yep. Um, you know, NASA does have a you know a desire to help get started LEO space stations, but it's still small dollars, right? So in all the growth areas that would really get uh, space enthusiasts excited, you have this huge opportunity cost, you know, of, of SLS, right. comparatively little investment in the, the highly disruptive trends. That could uh, be SLS represents nearly about 20% of the total budget and uh, wow, you should have you should have seen uh, Rick Tomlinson complaining about that yesterday, right? That uh, well, I mean, the is... thing is, the the opportunity cost when you look at this, you know, when if if a single SLS launch is going to be four point two billion dollars, right? Right. The opportunity cost of that, in terms of like what you could be putting down today with clips, just a you know a shotgun of clips landers right. or if starship you know comes the the you know how much more you could in theory put down on the lunar surface you know just really makes us think we're paying a a huge opportunity you know tax for for real progress on the moon you know for what sort of amounts to you know a you know a, a symbolic you know stunt to recapitulate you know what was apollo with you know, you know, with a with a different nuance. Right. I, you know, I personally think that you know that's that's costly. You know, what what I would like to see is, you know, NASA have a a really broad lunar COTS program where they and a really ambitious uh, lunar industrialization facility as a public private partnership park where they have articulated 
you know, these are our production targets for, for various, this is how much water, this is, you know, how much, you know, regolith, aluminum, you know, silicon. And I'd like to see it directed, you know, towards, you know, something that would be hugely impactful for one of the administration's goals, which is climate change. So right, yeah. I'm not I, I, I felt like it was kind of a missed opportunity when I looked at this thing. That, yeah, there's no space solar power, right? Right, um, right. You know, and, and here this is apparently, you know, the, uh, you know, the big, you know, existential threat, you know, that, uh, you know, that we are to be focusing on. And yet, you know, the place where space could truly play disruptively, you know, uh, you know, which would certainly include space solar power and might even include, you know, helium three on the moon. You know, there's just, there's nothing, there's no focus. You know, we don't seem to be going to the moon for, for any industrial purpose. It just seems, as you said, you know, we're, we're going to camp. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to camp before we, you know, chuck this and move on to Mars. So, you know, there, there is not a, a, you know, even an enabling vision that's even as clear as what the Chinese and Russians have put out for their moon base, right? We, we don't even have a good visual for what the Artemis base camp should look like. Well, and once again, you know, we've been, you've been pushing this North Star vision for almost two and a half years now. Uh, and that's not that's not in the budget, right? We can't, we can't see that. Uh, and, and I'll post, a, I'll post a link to that North star vision uh, set of documents here in a moment, but um, we cannot see evidence in the budget that that North star concept has been uh, accepted or, 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 or is being acted on. So. Uh, yeah. And what I would say is in both the NASA and the Space Force budget, both the good and the bad is that essentially they're on autopilot. You know, they do not reflect a, a big, bold new vision. You know, the good part about that is we are at least not reversing ourselves and losing ground. You know, the bad part is that, you know, this administration for whatever reason is choosing to focus on other things and is yet to find their footing in a, in a vision for space. They, you know, they, this National Space Council has been far less active than the last one. Um, they have not released, you know, a, a, an update of a new vision for uh, deep space exploration as the, the last administration did. Um, they seem, you know, to, to really not have their own vision for, you know, what we are trying to accomplish, you know, on the moon and cislunar. And, and I think that's that's reflected in the budget. I, I think it's sort of a, you know, a deal with the Congress of like, hey, we won't upset your apple cart. We'll just keep this funding, but, you know, don't expect, you know, right. true advocacy on our part. And I think that's a shame because in reality, I think the administration needs to realize that the big solutions for climate change absolutely involve the moon and in-space manufacturing. And I am oh. bullish that the administration will do something big on in-space uh, manufacturing and assembly, but I don't see it in this budget. Uh, you know, when, when uh, now President Biden was vice president, it was NASA and, and space was part of his mandate um, several years ago, and it was not a strong priority for him as vice president. And we've seen that reflected in um, Vice President Harris's kind of hands-off laissez-faire approach to, uh, to the National Space Council. So I can't say I'm very surprised. I will say I'm a little disappointed. Um, uh, but I had, I had high hopes for this, this budget um, proposal. Uh, you know, it's gonna get whittled down. It's gonna want it when it goes through the Congress you know, this is just a proposal. It's just a, hey, this is a good idea, right? Uh, it can change and it will change somewhat dramatically. Yeah, uh, and, and I think we, we don't know, right? I mean, you've got, you've got people on both sides. You know, you've got, for instance, Senator Sanders that's, that's really opposed to, you know, uh, adding money that might go to Blue Origin. Um, you know, on the other hand, you've got, you know, folks in Congress that are, 
you know, adamant that it's necessary to put in money for to for a second lander, that that's important to the nation and certainly would benefit us on our speed. You know, I have to say in general, you know, uh, at least in space, Congress have been the heroes. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have really been the ones who see it. So it would not surprise me if Congress pluses up in, in some of the areas that we think are deficient. And I truly hope that's the case because it does seem to me, I, I like you, right? I am not surprised. I am disappointed, um, but at least it's not as bad as many of us thought it might, might've been, right? right? But, you know, I, I think one of the things the administration has yet to grapple with are the, the costs of letting space go on autopilot, that space is such a significant part of, you know, the perception of international leadership. It has now become, you know, uh, amongst almost all of our, you know, key allies, you know, the, the UK, the ESA, uh, Japan, Australia, you know, all of these countries are now, you know, looking at space solar power and for the administration to have like nothing at all, you know, really puts us out of the driver's seat on one of the most disruptive climate change solutions. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the Space Force budget, which is also sort of, you know, uh, on auto autopilot. So what happened is it looks like a big plus up. But in, but can you just can you just pause for a second? I want to like stick with this topic for just a second longer. Um, the uh, you just said that the Congress is has been the heroes, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the people that Congress represent are the heroes, right? Because. Um, you know, SpaceX, when they, when they do a launch, any launch, but especially the big ones, uh, they're going to have a million people watching that launch, right? I remember back, oh gosh, maybe it was 1996 or 97 when we landed on Mars. There were like 7 million people watching that broadcast and they quote, it broke the internet, unquote. Now... That's just another Thursday, right? That a million people, maybe you know, on multiple channels, a million people, hundred thousand in, in in ten channels or something, are going to watch a SpaceX uh, launch. Uh, not quite the same popularity with Blue because their their media uh, game is not as strong, but nevertheless, uh, you know the. Uh, the flight that our friend George Niels was on uh, just two days ago, uh, it had 150,000 views on just one channel, right? So I feel like Congress is paying attention to the actual will of the people uh, in, in a way that I don't think they have been doing for a while. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some kudos to... Um, the support that the commercial space sector has that is starting to influence their members in Congress. So um, I, I just wanted to kind of like jump on the soapbox there for a second. Please jump. Let's let's go to let, let's let's go to Space Force now because you know it's one of my favorite topics. All right. So you know, first of all, you know, it's some of your. Uh, audience may be familiar with the blue water, brown water distinction, but if not, I'll just summarize it, right? Yeah. So brown water space power is the, is the thought that, you know, the, the chief role of the space force, you know, now and into the future is to, you know, look down upon the earth and support the joint force in the projection of military power. Blue water space power uh, sees the need for a space force more in terms of the future, sees it in, like a Navy that enables commerce abroad and, and expansion. Um, and, you know, this is a very, very brown water budget, right? It is a, it is a reactive budget driven, you know, predictably, you know, by the threat. Um, so, you know, the big winners, uh, you know, of course, are, uh, are classified budgets, um, really missile warning, uh, and then uh, SATCOM, those are really the big, you know, winners. Launch is about the same, 
the GPS PNT is about the same. Um, and then, you know, satellite command and control actually went down a little bit. Weather went down a little bit. Um, and then, you know, uh, one of the bright things is that there is now a commercial purchasing office, uh, you know, as of this year, and they continue it at about the same level of budget for next year. Is, um, is that the it, office that uh, Colonel Felt is going to, by the way? No, no, it, not it's different. not. There is a, a really, really sharp colonel there um, uh, who, uh, who is heading that up and he's got the right picture, really the right picture. Right. So, um, you know, that, that office could be extremely disruptive in a positive way, uh, you know, but they're only, you know, they've only got like $23 million, which, you know, is a, is a tiny fraction of a fraction, you know, that's like, you know, 10, 10 of 1% you know, <laughs> of the space force budget. Uh, and they're, and, you know, while they're, they've got big picture ideas about where they want to go in terms of, you know, space as a service, purchasing data, you know, everything, you know, uh, imagery data as, you know, space domain awareness, um, they've been specifically told to stay away from launch, which I think is a real mistake. Right. I think, you know, a, a, uh, a place like that that has the right mindset, you know, you could truly drive uh, in a commercial industry fast. So, you know, and, and let's be honest that 20, you know, 23 million is a long way away from the billion dollars that was recommended in the state of the space industrial base report. Right, right. A long way away yeah. from you know what uh, you know what industry and government experts thought you know was necessary you know uh, for the United States to be competitive. So you know the other thing you know that is you know one of the one of the things that really enables a lot of small companies to get their payloads and satellites you know up into space is the space test program. And that's funded at a measly 25 million, you know, which is nowhere near, you know, adequate uh, to, to move things forward. So, you know, the other thing is it, it looks like, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a massive increase. You know, it's like a 40% increase in budget, but it's really not because, you know, what, what uh, 3 billion of it is, is they just have moved the accounting. It's not new money. They've just moved the accounting of the personnel from the Department of the Air Force over to the Space Force so that their own people are now on their own budget, right? And by the way, that's great. We want visibility, you know, as the American people, as taxpayers, we want to know how much we're actually spending on space. So it's, it's terrific, you know, to, you know, to have that there. Um, then, you know, the, uh, um, the other thing that, that had happened was last year, or the budget that just passed, was a huge increase for the Space uh, Development Agency right. um, that had previously belonged directly to the Department of Defense. And why? Because they didn't feel as if the, the, uh, the historical forces in what had been Air Force Space Command, uh, Space and Missile System, would ever be able to, you know, sort of slaughter themselves to start building a, you know, many small things as opposed to a few, you know, multi-billion dollar large things. Exquisite, exquisite targets. So, um, you know, so the space, uh, the space development agency is now funded to build two tranches, you know, of the first tranche of like 28 satellites and the second of somewhere like 128, right? So that will mean that when the Space Force cuts over, sorry, when the Space Domain Space Development Agency cuts over to be part of the Space Force, it'll actually be bringing the majority of their satellites. <laughs> so, you know, they'll be bringing like 156 satellites, which is about right. double the 77 right. that the Space Force currently has. So I'm pretty bullish on SDA, and I really hope that the Space Force leadership allow it to keep its disruptive, fast moving, you know, keep things on, on time, on target. Um, and so, you know, that is, you know, that's, you know, pretty terrific. So, 
you've got about two billion, you know, that was funded this year for you know the, that capitalization of this proliferated low Earth orbit uh, missile tracking and transport layer. Uh, you know, this you know first time we're going to have a laser com internet, you know, in space. That's at least a government, uh, you know, part of it. You know, uh, of course, SpaceX is doing you know their own thing with with uh, laser cross links. Um, which is pretty exciting, but uh, you know, so that's moving over. And then, of course, you know, we're we're probably losing on the order of seven percent buying power. Um, you know, so that, you know, that's not, you know, not terrific. But as I said, there's there's significant. You know, it's about a billion dollars more in classified programs. There's about two billion dollars more in uh, in missile warning. Most of that is the SDA money. And then, uh, you know, SATCOM is back up to where it was two years ago, about a 50% uptick. And I think this really re re reflects the Space Force trying to meet, you know, the, the threats, you know, the, and, uh, and needs of the, of the joint force. But let's talk about what it's not, right? It is not a vision, you know, for developing, you know, cislunar. It is not a, 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 a budget that is about posturing us, you know, you know, to make sure that we are in the key positions, that we can defend commerce, that we can extend commerce. Um, you know, it's just weak on everything that is, uh, you know, blue space power. And, you know, that's, um, you know, when you talk about how much is cislunar in this past budget, you know, there's basically nothing that's specifically articulated for cislunar in the coming budget. But this past budget, you know, it, it's like 130 million, you know, out of you know, two thousand four hundred, you know, million out of you know, twenty four billion, right? So you know, we're we're less than a percent, you know, less than a percent of our space force budget is actually being spent on the outward facing part of uh, of space power. And, you know, I, you know, while I don't think that number today, you know, needs to be high, you know, it certainly needs to be larger than that. And, you know, I right. think probably, you know, for where we are in time, you know, a dedicated line of, a, you know, of about 2% probably is appropriate, cool. um, you know, for, uh, for blue water space power. And, and let's dig into blue versus brown a little bit. You described it a moment ago, but uh, for our audience, uh, you know, I'm a former U.S. Marine and they are designed for onshore activity, right? To get from, from the boats to the shore, that's the point that, for them to exist. Uh, and so they operate in a brown water environment for the Navy, right? Um, I live... Uh, really close to um, uh, to a lot of nuclear submarines, and they spend all of their time, most of their time, kind of way out in the middle uh, of the ocean, way under in the deep blue sea, right? And so that's, and if you take that analogy uh, and apply it to space, then the brown side is low earth orbit, uh, geosynchronous orbit, um, and, and every, and I mean, every single brown water person that I, that I encounter at, at uh, uh, Space Force and especially Air Force, um, they're all talking about the, you know, pay attention to the alligator that's biting your leg and ignore, ignore, the alligator that's 20 feet away. And I'm thinking that is a bad, that is a bad long-term strategy. I understand you have to solve the problem that's in front of you, but that is a bad long-term strategy. So, um, you know, I would love to see it's, it's Blue all, Water Space Force. It is negligent strategy, right? It, it is really, really bad. You know, one, because it's a false dichotomy, right? It, you. If you, if you have a long-term vision, it informs your near-term buys. 
So such that, you know, you are building an architecture that's not what, what some people call a strategic cul-de-sac, but you're going to have to now spend money later on buying something different when the threat moves higher, right? So not being anticipatory has a lot of costs, but it essentially seeds your strategic flank to your opponent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of the problem, you know, is that, you know, people, uh, you know, these folks that you're talking about, they're not adequately appreciating urgency. So, you know, there, there are different ways to understand urgency. So, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a young 20 year old who, you know, for the first time has their, their own apartment, you've got, you know, a certain amount of income and you definitely have must pay bills, right? You've got to, you know, pay for a bunch of things, right? But if you don't start saving for your retirement or your kid's college early on, you know, that grows exponentially. Or if you don't invest, it doesn't grow exponentially, which means that later on, you're going to have to exponentially catch up with that when, you know, it's much less favorable for you. So in the same way, right, if you want to be a great power in 30 years, you need to start investing 2% of your income, you know, in the long term. And that's urgent today because you're not going to have the bank account. You're not going to have the know-how you need later on. And it, you know, and basically, you know, as in investing, if you don't invest in your 20s, you really can't catch up later on. So, you know, urgency depends on what sort of exponential curve you're on. And it is urgent that you spend now in order to have, you know, in order to be where you need to be in the future. But the other thing that I think is a really uh, dangerous to the nation holdover, um, you know, from, you know, the, from Air Force thinking on space power is the idea that, you know, uh, my job is only to kill people and break things, you know, that it's, it's tactical, you know, uh, everything else is somebody else's job, right? Might be commerce's job or might be NASA's job, um, but, uh, but sustaining advantage via building an industrial base, that's an externality. That's, that's not, you know, I, the, the only purpose of, you know, industry is to feed my current requirements. And so, you know, that, that mindset of just looking at only, let me only look at my current military problem, you know, is going to, you know, run us into hot water in the long term, right? Because this is, you know, this is actually an ahistorical way, you know, the early air power, early naval power theorists certainly did not think this way. You know, Mahan and Mitchell did not think that way. They were very interested in building comprehensive space power. They were extremely concerned about, you know, what was happening in, in industry and in shipbuilding and aircraft building and academia and whether or not we were building, you know, mechanics. And they were very interested in building dual use infrastructure and securing key terrain like the Panama Canal or, right. or Pearl Harbor. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it has been an uphill battle to try to, um, you know, get uh, strategists to think about the fact that the, the role of a military officer and a military space strategist, you know, cannot be confined to just winning a tactical engagement. You have to be thinking about how to multiply your chess pieces, how to set up the board, how to be at the right place on the board before your opponent arrives there. Be where the puck is going, right? yeah. Right, be where the puck is going and be there with the mostest, right? So, so much of what is going to determine long-term space power is your industrial and logistical posture. And they're just, you know, there's, uh, there, there needs to be much more there. And really the disruptive investments on both the military and the civilian side are the things that are not happening on their own in the Moore's Laws type of fashion, right? So small sats, you know, cheap launch, you know, the train is tough, that's going there. We're, we're gonna benefit, we can just ride the wave, right? Check but the, you know, but the really disruptive things are mostly in space access, mobility and logistics 
outside of, you know, uh, well, assuming that we don't do something stupid and compromise Starship and the other fully reusable launch vehicles that people are trying to make, then everything else is in space logistics, right? So where is the nation's investment in extractive industries, right? What are we doing to try to, you know, move the bar on lunar, lunar mining, asteroid mining for propellant, for, uh, for materials? Where is the investment on in-space manufacturing? Where is the investment on in-space refueling, on propellant depots? And, you know, what is the coordinated strategy to create incentives, you know, for that to happen, right? There are great proposals out there. There are, you know, yep. Bruce Kayan has this idea of a space commodities exchange. You know, there's this idea of plussing up the commercial purchasing to a billion dollars to drive it. There's the idea of like Foundation for the Future's idea of about a space corporation that might be sort of like a, you know, a, a investment fund or InQtel for space focused on infrastructure. You know, there's an idea out there about a, you know, L1 strategic, you know, propellant, strategic minerals, you know, depot. Uh, Armin Papazian has got this idea for uh, uh, special capitalization, you know, funds that, that go directly into this. Uh, there's an idea about space bonds to fund space infrastructure, you know, off the books of the, uh, of the annual budget. Uh, and then there are, you know, legislative uh, things like Wayne White's the Space Pioneer Act that create um, security and incentives for, you know, pioneers that would move out, right? Nothing, right? None of these are being acted upon. Right. You know, right. these ideas are, are out there in the ether. They have not been adopted. You know, you don't, you know, you don't hear the vice president talking about them. You don't hear the National Space Council secretary talking about them. You don't hear the NASA administrator talking about them. You don't hear the chief of space operations talking about them. You don't hear the secretary of the Air Force who needs to you know, also act as the secretary of the Space Force, right? None of the key leadership are, are, are articulating what is the program to drive the incentives to take advantage of our commercial and industrial advantage that's going to maximize uh, you know, U.S. power and ability, you know, to shape this domain. We talk a lot about wanting to shape the norms in space, but we are just not, it, we're not investing in the policy infrastructure that is going to enable this. And for the most part, like this is, this is fiscal dollars free, right? right. Yep. Making these innovations, you know, has a certain tax in terms of the, the time and political capital you would need to get it across the finish line. But ultimately they're just words, words and policy and law um, that, that may not even need, you know, budget dollars to, to drive them. And right, it's, it's just a decision to say, this is the path that we're going, everybody march that direction. Let me, let me uh, uh, ask a quick question because one of our allies, uh, Colonel Felt, is changing roles, changing positions. And by the way, we only have three minutes until our next speaker, so please answer quickly. But where is, where is Colonel Felt going, and is he going to be in a position to drive any of this in innovation since he's been so, so effective at AFRL so far? He's been unbelievably effective, and not just with AFRL, right? I think he has been material in changing the mindset Mm -hmm. of the Space Force to look more commercial. Uh, I, I doubt that we would have had, you know, many of the innovations that we have had, you know, I think he's been effective um, in helping push them in their space futures. I think he's been an effective partner with DIU, with SpaceWorks. Yep. Um, and so, you know, he is moving up to the service acquisition executive, uh, you know, as one of the deputies there who will be in charge of a number of things, in, in, including uh, science and technology investment. And so, you know, that, that's a fantastic opportunity for the nation 
uh, to have a, have such a clear thinker on this with such a terrific background in the in the core uh, technology of the possible moving uh, to inform that position. And he's going to be replaced by a colonel coming out of the uh, uh, of the space RCO, I believe, uh, who also is known to be very sharp. Okay. So you know that's that's going to uh, I think continue AFRL's you know leadership in this. You know I, if uh, it might be worth posting AFRL's recent uh, uh, Cislunar Highway Patrol video, which I think is just amazing. It's amazing, yeah. Uh, fantastic, you know, vision of uh, of blue water, and of course, you know, uh, Colonel Felt has a uh, uh, an article in Space Force Journal that I think really lays out. I, I think you know he and his team, because um, it is not just him, right? He has a whole right, yeah, yeah, team yeah. Of people that have really thought ahead. Uh, um, you know, so that that's a that's a terrific. Uh, projection, you know, of, you know, how far ahead uh, they, they have thought. So I see, you know, I really see, you know, the, the Space First Lab, Space Lab, you know, aka AFRL Space Vehicles, you know, they are, they have truly been in the intellectual driver's seat, you know, um, you know, for the outward looking, you know, vision of space. Program. That's kind of what you'd assume, you know, for a lab. Um, we're going to switch gears. If you could uh, post those links, definitely the, the Highway Patrol um, uh, video is terrific. So post that and then uh, um, you reference another document. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you could post those, that would be terrific. Um, as always, sir, it's terrific um, having you here. We really appreciate it. Uh, especially on such short, short notice. I feel like a lot of this program this month has been short notice responses. Um, uh, uh, the, the invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, put basically my, my program, my schedule for last month and this month basically became Swiss cheese. Like all these, all these people are like, nope, sorry, can't talk. Um, so I've been a little bit scrambling last month and this month to put our program together. So thanks very much, sir, for, uh, for being a part of this. Uh, very well. Uh, thanks. Take care. All right, Dr. Elbrook, how are you doing, sir? Doing well, thank you. Good. Great to be back. Good, good, good. Um, Interesting I, to hear Peter talk. Uh, yeah, have you all never connected? I don't, don't think you've... Uh, usually Peter's on day one, and and Egbert, you're on day two, so you may never have connected. Um, That's true. I, I'm just going to take a moment and kind of like ad hoc this for a second. Um, I've known Gerritsen... Uh, gosh, going on five, six years or so, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, he was uh, uh, quietly in the background and then eventually became very loud in the background in the development of U.S. Space Force. Um, so I, I really admire him for putting his career on the line for that. So thanks, sir, for that. Um, uh, Egbert, I've only known for about a year and a half, but as a guy that is uh, really leading the charge in the development of, you know, taking humans out of our ecosystem that we're comfortable in and, and building, a, building a, a possible future so that humanity can um, grow and thrive off world, whether that's space stations right now or the moon and Mars, um, y'all are, y'all are very different kinds of people, but you have the same big ideas and, uh, you know, this vision for humanity. So I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm happy to connect y'all. Um, uh, I, I think, I think you would share a lot in, uh, in common. Um, Egbert, Egbert's coming in from, uh, the Netherlands. Peter, you're, you're normally in, uh, uh Huntsville, Alabama, right? Even though you spent a lot of time in DC. Close. I, I'm in Montgomery, Alabama. 
Montgomery. Okay, cool. Right on. All right. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Pierre. Really great having you. We're going to swap, switch gears over to, uh, to Egbert. Um, uh, let me pull up some bios here. Give me a second. Dr. Elbrook is the founder and CEO of Spaceborne United. His research and mission design company researches and enables the conditions of, for human reproduction in space. The research outcomes and missions program provide a, critic, a crucial contribution for becoming a multiplanetary species. The current focus is enabling conception and early embryo development in LEO for which Spaceborne United developed artists assisted reproduction technology in space. Uh, as always, uh, Egbert is great, great having you here. Thank you, sir. I'm excited to be here again. And uh, yeah, it's good to see the audience is growing and uh, the partnerships are growing. So I'm happy to be back and uh, give an update <clears throat> to the audience. Uh, let, let, me, let me just use that as a, as a plug point. Um, I uh, really want to thank our allies and friends. Um, the uh, Center for Space Commerce and Finance is hosting an investment, uh, Space Investment Summit in uh, May 25th and 26th. They are a partner of ours and are broadcasting our message. Uh, the Moon Society has been very, very supportive uh, broadcasting our, our show. Uh, co-broadcasting our show um, to their audience last month and this month. Uh, and we'll have a, a big, um, big show uh, uh, really about analogs, uh, showcasing some of the work that Mars Desert Research Station has done in July. And then uh, a new partner, Axonar um, Aries Studios, uh, with their Legion there are 100,000 plus legion of Star Trek fans. So uh, thanks, you know, thanks for them for, for um, being supportive of our, of our program. So th thanks, Edbert. I, I, didn't, I didn't really want to take your, your thunder, but since you did bring up our partners and sponsors and, and audience, I, I do want to do a shout out for them. Thanks. Take it away, sir. Yes. So let me share the screen. Uh, as you requested, I will summarize the first some 10 minutes, things that uh, earlier uh, audiences may have heard, but just to, to make sure that everybody is on the, on the same page. Right. Well, it's important to note that as our audience is growing, um, we're bringing in new people all the time. So this review is really important. Thank you. I'm gonna be quiet now. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the introduction. So we're going to talk about babies in space, and the progress uh, for, regarding our research in preparing conception and childbirth in space. Um, to summarize again, the three main activities that we have uh, from our uh, headquarters here in the Netherlands, the beautiful UFO shaped building. Uh, the first uh, thing we do is indeed, we research the conditions for human reproduction in space that means we look at a lot of research that has already been done by the agencies, by uh, research institutes, etc. The second thing is that we translate the research outcomes into a missions program that includes the, the industry partners and the research partners that are willing and able to execute those missions. And the third thing is we translate the research outcomes into the biomedical uh, equipment that is required for these missions. So we're now focusing on the biomedical equipment that enables IVF in space, conception and early embryo development. So uh, as Michael um, said, this is a very big subject. So people would expect, well, why is, 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 is NASA or ESA or other agencies or big companies, why are they not addressing this challenge? Um, the main the main explanation is that uh, they have to work with taxpayer money. And it's very uh, challenging to address uh, ethically delicate subjects, such as space life science and, and reproduction uh, 
specifically. Um, NASA, for example, is very explicit about this. They're very open about this and they explicitly encourage focused niche comp companies like ours to, to address this challenge. Another um, reason is that it's, it's difficult for, for the agency to work on, on long-term goals. They need short-term goals, again, to satisfy the taxpayers uh, to a great deal. And as the, the, um, the president is, is, is uh, uh, changing a lot, if Trump wants to go left, um, Biden needs to go left, uh, etc. So NASA is, is uh, experiencing a lot of extra challenges because of this. We we are not uh, we we are positioned in in a more favorable way. Um, so that's what we're doing. But then, okay, what does it mean? Reproduction in space? That's not just one thing. It consists of 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 many uh, stages of reproduction, and we are researching and enabling all the different stages of reproduction. So the first stage, conception, and the very last stage, childbirth in space. Uh, but there are a lot of stages in between, uh, embryo development, fetus development. Uh, so we're also monitoring developments like uh, artificial wombs. Um, and we're also working on this very last stage. I mean, the name of the company is Spaceborn United. Um, that is because we are also aiming for our very long-term goal of childbirth in space. And then space is not just one area, it, it is different areas. So we are taking it in a step-by-step -step approach starting in low Earth orbit. And focusing on <clears throat> the first stage of reproduction, um, enabling um, IVF in space. So IVF is an example of an assisted reproductive technology, and we are extending this into space. So we are re-engineering this existing IVF technology. So we are dealing with, with different uh, challenges. Of course, the main challenge of, of gravity and radiation exposure. And um, that's why we re-engineer IVF technology in low earth orbit and we provide artificial uh, rotational gravity because we are taking this step by step. That means that the embryo development needs to happen in the earth-like gravity environment. Um, and of course we cannot work with human embryos, human uh, oocytes and sperm cells uh, to start with. We have to, uh, to address it step by step. So we start with animal models then work our way up to uh, uh, stem cell embryos and then work with real human embryos. And why are we doing this? Eventually we need to learn if uh, human embryos can develop in a healthy way in different gravity environments, especially the Mars gravity environment, as this is the main, <clears throat> the main uh, goal um, for human settlements. So, on the left, you see a visual of a standard IVF incubator that is used in IVF clinics on Earth. And of course, uh, they, they have never been developed or designed um, to have a very optimal uh, mass or volume or energy consumption. So we are optimizing this uh, technology to work in space uh, in a better way. And we are adding these functionalities, as I mentioned, artificial gravity, um, uh, standard embryo incubators uh, are just enabling embryo development and we're also enabling uh, the conception itself. So we start with, with the, the female cells, the oocytes, and the male cells, the sperms, and they come together in space to, to realize conception. After five days of embryo development, it's important to, to pause the development because after five days, the embryos really need a natural womb to, uh, for further development. And we are pausing the development by applying uh, cryogenic freezing. Um, and of course, we are working with, a, with an IVF device that is inside a satellite, a recoverable satellite, 
but and, and it's an unmanned satellite, so we need everything to be remotely controlled. And um, besides uh, learning if the Mars gravity environment will be sufficient for healthy embryo development, um, we are filling a lot of data gaps in the partial gravity domain. So uh, most of our experts expect that the Mars gravity level will not be a healthy level. It should be more, should be more towards the Earth gravity level. Uh, but we can we can find out with our equipment. So we can adjust we can adjust the gravity level, uh, and 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 one of the outcomes uh, could be, for example, I'm just making up a number that embry human embryos need at least 76 percent of the earth gravity for healthy development and this this outcome will be crucial for uh, it has crucial implications for the mars architecture uh, related to to reproduction uh, so for example uh, pregnant women would need to compensate for example uh, during during the night they could spend uh, they could spend the night in rotating bedroom areas where they sleep in 1G or uh, a little more to compensate for the gravity loss during the day. That's the main scientific added value of what we're doing. So how are we doing this? Um, <clears throat> we're applying, we're combining different uh, key technologies. Uh, there's a lot going on in the, in the domain of uh, IVF on a chip uh, and microfluidic technologies. And we uh, we apply uh, micro 3D printed um, um, disks, a life support system, basically. I'll get an, into that in a second. <clears throat> and this is all placed in a pressurized chamber to make sure to make sure the embryos have the right uh, climate conditions. And uh, as I mentioned, we apply a cryogenic freezing to pause the development. So this disk that I was talking about, um, the life support system, the key of our, of our artist device. This is just an artist's impression, but it, it shows the basic idea where uh, the different fluids, the sperms, uh, the culture media, and the reaction chambers on the outsides of the disk um, are, are placed and, and the fluids can be reallocated through the microfluidic channels. Um, and this is where, where the magic will happen. This is where the, the conception and embryo development will take place. But this is just a key layer of, of such a disk. Um, this is a 3D rendering of uh, an early prototype design with more detail. But um, if you see, you see below the different additional layers of such a disk of this life support system that will, will enable embryo development. Um, the, the size of the disc is, is really comparable to, to uh, what we were used to, the, the, the compact discs, the CD-ROMs will be a lot thicker, but that's the, the diameter, more or less. So what happens with these discs? We, we um, combine them in an artificial uh, gravity generator, and then we insert it in a pressurized chamber, and then it goes into the satellite, the recoverable satellite, into a rocket. We've been exploring the option of uh, Virgin, Virgin, uh, Virgin Orbit, with their Launcher One system. It's a very smart, smart approach to skip the first 12 kilometers of the atmosphere, and then the the Boeing, the, the Cosmic Girl, as they call it is actually a reusable first stage for them. So then you only need a relatively small and affordable rocket to do the rest all the way into low Earth orbit. Uh, we've been exploring more options. I'll, I'll go into that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we are not just uh, developing the biomedical equipment. We're also designing the missions and, and different missions into a missions program. So all the way, um, um, from the pre-launch to the launch phase and the operational phase, and also obviously the recovery phase, because we want to examine the embryos after their development in space. Um, this is this mission profile shows the Cosmic Girl, the, the, the Virgin plane, 
and the launcher one system. Um, but there are other options that we're looking at. So um, yeah, looking at the time, maybe I should not go into all the details here, but you can imagine we are uh, puzzling with all the, the details for all the, the launch phases and all the steps in the IVF process. They're all taken care of in our uh, mission plans. We're not doing this uh, alone. We have a lot of um, industry uh, partners, expertise, um, research uh, partners. We're uh, doing a lot with, with uh, universities. One of the key universities we work with is Cranfield University in the UK, um, but also Denmark University of Technology and um, uh, King's College London. Um, Rhodium Scientific is our important uh, partner for life science experiments in space. Um, the same as uh, Biologic I'm, and um, well, um, let me not go into all the details. You can imagine we have all different partners for all stages of the mission. Um, I promise to talk about progress. I, uh, uh, I like how uh, Michael always uh, emphasized the difference between PowerPoint companies and uh, companies that actually do things, that actually make things, and that even uh, take their, their, uh, their hardware into space. And uh, this is going to be a very special year for Spaceboard United. We're very excited that we are that we have already started to make hardware. Uh, one of the implementation partners will be presenting today, actually, to explain more details about it. Uh, we're now uh, working on the designs for the hardware for the first prototypes, um, and we're actually going to have this hardware, the first prototypes in space this year, around September, actually. Um, we might even have the first life science, life science experiments in space um, if we will be able to insert uh, mouse embryos in our prototype, but that's, that's uncertain. That would be extremely exciting, but we are already very excited for, uh, because of these steps. So as I mentioned, we're not just uh, looking at the Virgin Orbit uh, options. We've also been exploring uh, Dawn Aerospace, an upcoming uh, um, company with also with a reusable plane, but <clears throat> with an unmanned reusable plane. Uh, but they're still in development. This is an example of one of their versions that has been tested. Uh, we would be needing the bigger version of this, the MK3, which is about um, 15 meters uh, across and has the payload capacity that we need of around 100 kilograms or more. And the other image on the right is the uh, ESA Space Rider that could also be an option. And the question marks refer to the one that we are um, that we are working with in 2022, uh, Space Ride, the Canadian company, and we can join their test flights this year. Actually, this month, by the end of this month, is uh, a captive carry test where they will take their uh, rocket into their uh, mounted into this uh, controlled drone system that you can see on the right um, that is lifted by a large balloon up to 20 or 25 kilometers of altitude. So in that way, they don't just skip 12 kilometers of the atmosphere, but they're skipping 20 to 25 kilometers of atmosphere. That's about 99.9%, .9%, which is really uh, helpful um, to skip the, 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 the atmospheric drag, with the very comfortable max Q for the rocket. So they only need uh, a really small and affordable rocket for the rest, uh, the rest of the trip into space. Um, so in April, uh, oh, that is in, by the end of this month, we will um, um, have a volume simulator on board for the re-entry device that is provided by Spaceworks. Um, because we want to examine our embryos 
And after examination, we also want to place the mouse embryos back in the natural wombs and eventually also with the human embryos. So um, the re-entry device shown on the right is inside the rocket um, and the volume simulator will be on board for this month. I really hope uh, the planning goes, goes well. It's, it's, it's kind of weatherproof um, because this balloon uh, is not really affected by, uh, by, by weather changes a lot. So I hope next month I will be, will be able to, uh, to show some footage of this system going up and going all the way up to 20, 25 kilometers. Um, I was mentioning implementation partners. Let me, um, uh, Akil and his team, um, Tommaso will be uh, presenting later uh, this uh, today to explain what they're doing. I just wanted to make sure that I've mentioned them. Frontier Space Technologies. Um, and I included the visual again of the microfluidic disk, our life support system that will uh, enable the, the conception and the embryo development. Um, that's the key element that they are um, manufacturing for us, but they're also uh, manufacturing the pressurized chamber and all the other subsystems, the climate control device, uh, some sensors, etc. cetera. But, uh, I'll leave that to uh, Tommaso. Um, I wanted to add um, that they are uh, a spin-off, so to, so to speak, from Cranfield University, one of our key universities that we're working with. This is uh, some uh, pictures of already, I think four years ago when I, uh, when I met uh, Professor Dave Cullen and also uh, Akil. Um, Professor Dave Cullen has been supervising a lot of research projects for us that sometimes also included uh, graduation students. We've learned so much from them um, and we're now very happy that uh, Dave Cullen also introduced us again to Akil and his team from uh, Frontier Space Technologies. Um, looking at the time, um, yeah, let me briefly re repeat this. This is focused, the, the, our artist device, our IVF in space device is focused on enabling human reproduction, but it seems that it will also be helpful in selecting uh, animals um, that could thrive in a Mars gravity environment. Uh, humans could compensate for lower gravity during the day and they could they could uh, sleep in rotating bedrooms uh, for compensation or things like this. Uh, animals are not gonna do this, obviously. So we need to make sure that we find the right animals, the right mammals in this case, that would also thrive in, in just 39% of earth gravity. And our device uh, could be helpful there as well. So we might have additional added value um, helping to prepare for uh, terraforming and, and having the right biodiversity eventually. Uh, as you know, as you hear, we are looking at the really at the long-term reproduction in space um, for humans and maybe even for mammals. Talking about the future, um, let's go into this a little bit. Reproduction in space and its future, as I mentioned before, um, Space Born United is also uh, simultaneously looking at childbirth in space. Um, we think that will take another more or less 15 years, maybe it's even going to be 20 years, maybe 12 years, something like this, uh, before we can have a mission in which we enable uh, childbirth and actually take a highly pregnant woman into space. Um, not for nine months, we're not talking about uh, pregnancy in space, we're just talking about uh, a 24 hour mission, maybe a little bit longer. Um, our experts in this field, um, they are sure that this can happen in, even in a, in, in a safer way than the average uh, Western style uh, childbirth on earth. 
and that should be uh, the starting point. Um, we are monitoring especially the developments of the, the space tourism industry as they are uh, preparing for spacecraft with uh, more gentle G profiles with not the extreme G-forces that the astronauts are currently being exposed to. Uh, space tourists, they wouldn't be interested in, in, in space tourism if they would be exposed to five or six Gs during launch and re-entry. <clears throat> and it's very good to see that uh, the spacecraft uh, from Shara Space that you see below, the Dream Chaser spacecraft, this is just a scale model, obviously, it can, it can uh, take up to uh, seven people in space. And it already has a very comfortable G profile, at least during re-entry. So the developments are looking good. And that's, we are really depending on, on uh, developments like, like these um, to determine what the timeline will actually be. Um, so um, we're working on a lot of uh, more, a lot more details looking at the selection criteria, uh, because we can only work with uh, women that have already given birth twice um, to make sure that, the, and, and those uh, two times should have been completely flawless. And we're not just working with one or two women, we're working with uh, several dozen of women because um, they would be, uh, they can step out of the program at any given moment. That is the ethical starting point, uh, even up to one day before the launch. And um, the main reason why we have to work with, with a lot of women is that we are going to monitor the pregnancy um, in detail and any indication that could, uh, well, indicate complications would mean that they cannot be taken into space eventually. I can um, elaborate for hours on all of this, but uh, I've got to keep it short here. Um, so let's move on to some other details of the future. Artificial wombs, they're being uh, made in three locations um, in the world. Uh, one location is actually uh, the city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, but that's actually the city where I live, where Spaceborne United is founded. And the team of Professor Uy is um, 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 re-engineering the existing artificial womb for animals to make it apl applicable for human babies. They're not doing this because they want to uh, accelerate space life science or space exploration. They're doing this to improve the, the lung development for premature babies uh, that would otherwise uh, suffer uh, from all kinds of uh, handicaps. Um, but this is the reason why we are following them. One of our implementation partners, Life Tech Group, is also part of the, this project. Uh, this project so that helps us to really closely monitor uh, this development because eventually we think this will be uh, really helpful for. Uh, for human reproduction beyond Earth. There are even groups um, like Next Nature Network, uh, initiated by Professor von Mensford, and one of their projects is called Reproductopia, Reproduction Utopia. And they're looking at different futures, different possible futures, and they include even very exotic futures in which animals um, could give birth to human children. Um, let's not go into that today too much, but just to give you a, a, an idea of um, what research groups are actually uh, looking at and that could eventually become relevant for, uh, for human reproduction. Um, the last example that I wanna share uh, that I also have shared before is the work of uh, Dr. Hannah from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel and his team, and they succeeded in extending this, uh, this threshold of five days outside of, the, of the, 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 the natural womb. They succeeded in extending this embryo development um, during 11 days for mouse, for mice uh, embryos. 
and that's actually uh, uh, about half the gestation time for for these uh, mice and we are pretty sure that uh, these successes can uh, one day also uh, mean that we can extend our artist missions from five to maybe also uh, 10 or 11 days. Um, I want to talk about uh, progress in terms of team reinforcement. We are extremely excited that, um, uh, that Dr. Sheila Ali um, was very eager to join our advisory board. She her, her expertise in general is IVF in space. So that's a perfect match. And it's very hard to find uh, medical experts that have the courage to, to uh, well, to, to, to join these pioneering projects. Speaking about courageous minds, um, uh, she has been working with uh, NASA for about 10 years in the biology research program. She has a degree in and a lot of experience in clinical embryology. Uh, and now her main focus is reproductive technology in space. Uh, she's also an entrepreneur. She has her own scientific, scientific director services. And she's currently also a laboratory director in, uh, in an IVF clinic in Dallas. And now she has joined Spaceborn United. And um, one very exciting thing for us is that she will be uh, talking about us and about Artis, which is also her uh, field of expertise, of course, in this conference in, uh, in, in Austin next month. And um, she will be one of the keynote speakers. And the audience there, the, 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 the reproductive biology experts, they're not interested in space. They're not interested in IVF in space, at least not um, for reasons of, of space exploration or reproduction in space. The reason they're interested in her keynote is that uh, she will explain how the innovations um, of IVF in space will benefit the IVF uh, processes on Earth. And that is really helpful for Spaceborne United because that's also going to accelerate our business cases. And so we are um, uh, in discussion with investors and thanks to uh, Dr. Ali, uh, there is a completely, uh, uh, well, a very strong business case to help IVF on Earth as well. Um, another team member that I wanna um, introduce Dr. Alexander Leyendecker. I think he will be on the show maybe next month or the month after. He's already uh, one of our advisors uh, since um, uh, three, three years ago. Uh, and he did his PhD in human sexuality and human reproduction in space. Well, that's another very strong match, obviously. Uh, we're very happy to have him on board and um, after his PhD, he did decide to um, go with his passion as a helicopter pilot, as a rescue helic helicopter pilot for the Air United States Air Force. Um, but he's about to, uh, to end that part of his career because he really wants to go back to his passion for, uh, uh, for reproduction in space. Um, and he, in between during his, his uh, Air Force career, he is still uh, joining events, uh, online space events or physical events. He uh, did a lot of uh, keynotes in, in, in Austin uh, also. Um, and he will be joining uh, both me and uh, Simon Dubay and Shauna Pandia. Uh, we have joined panels before together, but it seems that there will be a, a lot more uh, a lot more opportunities uh, upcoming in the next couple of months. Uh, that seems to be some rather big media thing that I'm, I think we can reveal more in about two months. Um, uh, looking at the time, maybe I should, uh, oh, I have to emphasize one last thing. Um, uh, Alexander 
he started his uh, ASRI, the Astro Sexological Research Institute. And um, he wants Spaceborne United to be a partner. And of course, we want to be a partner as well. And actually, I assume um, Simon Dubay will also be joining, but I hope he can uh, explain uh, if he is having any such discussions uh, later today. And I really hope uh, Shauna Pandia will also join. Um, but one, one thing at a time. I think I'm at the end of my talk for today. And I like to end with the Carl Sagan quote that our space exploration plans are best described as a dandelion, I think I pronounced it wrong again, um, <laughs> spreading the seeds of life into space. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Brilliant, sir. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, in what was it again? Dandelion? Well, how do you? Dan how do I dandelion. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, no worries, man. <laughs> uh, uh, your uh, your your English is a whole lot better than my Dutch, so thank you for uh, uh, you know, don't don't be embarrassed by by mispronunciation. Um, uh, us. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. That was great. Um, it's so fun to watch this evolve, right? Month after month after month, incremental success after incremental success. Very excited about what's happening with Space Ride. Super excited about your uh, your other team members. Um, it's just it's just fun to watch this whole thing uh, unfold in real time, right? And and successes and and you know there's going to eventually be setbacks too. Uh, we're going to be broadcasting this. Um, you know, this adventure right alongside you. So super to have you, super great to have you and your team as, as part of this. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Always uh, happy to uh, tell about the progress. Perfect. And also the, about setbacks. That's part of the <laughs> game that there yeah. has been many setbacks, but we right. learned how to deal with them. Uh, it's resilience, right? It's that goes to your core, uh, uh, that core, goes to your core PhD on courage. Um, you're getting some great comments, by the way. I'm just going to read some of them from uh, from uh, uh, from Pete. He's like, that was super cool. I had no idea there was so much going on. Um, he also is referencing um, an organization called, uh, where is it? Inversion, Inversion, as a company that is doing um, re-entry work. And I posted their link in the chat. So you can take a look at what they're doing. And then he had some questions regarding, you know, is this artificial wound technology also available for uh, trauma medicine in adults, for example, treating bleeding in zero G? Um, uh, and is there work on artificial placenta and umbilical cords. And I don't, I don't know if you know the answers to those questions. I, I know the answer to the second part. Um, the, the first part, uh, I don't. I, I'm, I, uh, I, have, I don't have an, uh, a background in, in space medicine, but I know about the, the, the artificial wombs and the artificial placenta. Um, so that's part of, of, of the, the artificial womb uh, project. And, and one of those challenges are um, well, the fetus is growing and the placenta should then also be growing in the same rate and, and, and making um, uh, uh, tubes that grow. That's really complicated. And, and, and uh, adjusting that the growth rate to the, to the changing new tubes, that's, that's not how they want to, 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 to make it. So those are big challenges in, in, in this project uh, to, to make a placenta, an artificial placenta uh, that, that can keep up with, with the development of the, of the fetus. Um, but I don't know any more details, but I do know that the placenta is part of it and, and some of those challenges. You know, uh, his background as a, as a retired uh, lieutenant colonel, um, you know, he's always going to think about defense and DOD applications. And certainly uh, there's probably some research dollars available um, 
for this kind of work, uh, because I've said to you before, right, a lot of the work that you're doing has applications in the real world down here on the ground, right? That, that, that this isn't just a stunt about going into the sky, it's making life on earth better. Uh, and so there may be some research capital uh, available for um, the work that you're doing, if you, in the much broader sense, in, in a lot of different diverse uh, uh, sectors of our society. Yeah, and, and especially now that we're, that, that are, I mean, we knew there would be this business case or, or uh, research uh, uh, grant opportunity around the IVF in space um, because of the potential benefits for IVF on Earth. But we were just very busy with, with uh, taking care of all the, the other challenges. And, that, and that's another reason why it's very good that, that Dr. Sheila Ali uh, is going to present about all this. Uh, and that, that will be helpful in, in finding those dollars as well. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, uh, uh, Pete's not surprised by stuff very often. I mean, he's got his finger on the pulse of an awful lot of technology. Uh, his day job is at a think tank uh, in the DC region to um, provide advice uh, to ultimately to Congress and, and to uh, uh, staffers, policy staffers. So he's not surprised by space stuff very often. So I, I would count that as a pretty good kudos from him. Um, sorry, Pete, I'm putting words in your mouth. All right, uh, we're gonna switch gears. It is really great to have uh, uh, Simon Dubé on our program. Um, uh, uh, this is the first time I'm meeting Simon, so great to have you here, sir. Appreciate it. I'm going to read off your bio here, and then you can take it away. Uh, Simon Dubé is a PhD candidate and a public scholar in psychology at Concordia University, specializing in human sexuality, aerobotics, and sex or space sexuality. Sexual Ology. I've gotten that wrong several times. And I want to make sure. And I, I need you to explain the difference between sexuality and sex, sexology. All right. So that's one thing. Um, the comprehensive study of extraterrestrial intimacy and sexuality. In 2021, he first authored The Case for Space Sexology, a, pa a, public, a paper published in the Journal of Sex Research, which aims to integrate sex research into space programs. Uh, fascinating topic. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grant you uh, the title of doctor during this conversation. I know you're a candidate, and I know that that's an important distinction. But uh, thanks very much for being here, uh, Dr. Dubé. Appreciate it. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. And also, hello to Egbert. I, I listened to your talk, and as per usual, uh, Love your project, love everything you're doing. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation and to uh, your questions. Well, obviously, human sexuality is everything that has to do with uh, we'll talk, what we'll talk about today, but sexology is the study, the comprehensive study of human sexuality, from love, sex, and intimate relationships to everything that has to do with uh, lifespan development to reproductive and consent and anything that, everything that we'll be discussing in this presentation. And there's a good part that will explain uh, what this entails. Great. Um, do you have some slides? Uh, the screen's yours. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So, just uh, share my screen. Okay. Just making sure that's all right. Can you see my slide all right? Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Pleasure to be here. So, what will sex look like in space? Can humans reproduce outside of our home planet? How do we build meaningful, intimate lives beyond Earth? Hello, everyone. My name is Simon Dubé, and as has been said, I'm a PhD candidate in psychology at Concordia University in Montreal. I specialize in human sexuality, robotics, and space sexology, the comprehensive scientific study of extraterrestrial intimacy and sexuality. And today, uh, the main goals of this talk are to emphasize the importance of holistically considering space eroticism, as well as highlight 
a preliminary roadmap for the next 20 years of space exology. Your input uh, on the latter would be particularly appreciated to ensure that future space stations and settlements are both safe and pleasurable. So without further ado, to survive and thrive, but also to understand our universe and continue to expand into the cosmos, humanity must learn to live beyond their home planet Earth. As such, we are entering the age of space colonization with several upcoming national and private missions to the International Space, Mission, Space Station, the Moon and Mars. These missions aim to conduct research, occupy strategic, military and political economic positions, explore uh, resources, bolster space tourism, and eventually settle our solar system. Now, this modern day space race is progressively making space flights more accessible to a wider clientele, which raises several questions about how to make space life compatible with human needs, including our intimate and sexual needs. After all, as you well know, space is always trying to kill you and long-term space missions and settlements pose significant technical challenges like building vehicles and viable habitats, which intersect human challenges, such as enabling health, psychosocial adaptation, and performance during space flights. Among these human challenges are several constraints imposed by space on our sexual and intimate relationships. These ranges from gravitational changes, radiation exposure, isolation and stress, to being away from significant others, accessing intimate partners, as well as contending with potential harassment, the personal conflicts, and issues of privacy and hygiene aboard space habitats. Addressing the sexological realities of space life is crucial, as they may otherwise lead to the imposition of detrimental and unpractical policies of involuntary abstinence, which could in turn incite stress, anxiety, and depression, heighten risks of violence, as well as generate tensions between crew members in an already dangerous environment where cooperation is primordial. Addressing such reality is also important to favor mission success, as well as to ensure that future candidates feel like they are not contributing to our long-term space endeavors at the expense of their intimate well-being. Despite that, uh, NASA, and frankly, other space agencies as well, have historically shied away of almost any sex-related topics. But fear not, uh, there seems to be hope. Uh, we are seeing a slow shift in NASA's discourse as they move from publicly stating in 28 that they were not studying sexuality in space to stating this year in 2022 that should a future need for more in-depth study on reproductive health in space be identified, NASA would take the appropriate steps. Well, I am here to tell you today that there is a need, it is identified, and it actually has been for quite a bit of time now. Still to date, um, fields like bioastronautics, space medicine, and astronautical hygiene have yet to directly and comprehensively address the wide spectrum of human eroticism in space, ranging here from relational and socioaffective processes to intimate relationships and sexual activities. Now, this situation is untenable given our long-term space endeavors, and my team and I are trying to change it. Specifically, we are trying to get the public and space organizations to acknowledge the importance of eroticism in human existence, and accordingly, develop a permanent research program dedicated to space sexology, along with its relevant institutions and scientific agenda. Of course, the idea of studying sexology-related topics in space is nothing new, even though space organizations don't advertise it much. Over the years, several experiments have investigated the reproduction and early development of vertebrates under space conditions. Scholars have identified and called for more research on the broader issues related to human sexuality in space for more than 30 years. Other academics have comprehensively described the anticipated challenges associated with space eroticism 
along with their potential influence on mission success. They've also called for the systematic study of human sexuality in extraterrestrial context, emphasized the need to develop technical solutions to allow sex in space, reviewed the limited human and non-human animal research related to the differential impacts that space could have across sex and gender when it comes to their reproductive health, and of course, advocated for the development, as Dr. Edelbach mentioned, the development of a permanent institute dedicated to the study of space eroticism. Together, the work of these scholars highlight that with sufficient time, intimacy and sexuality will, and to, must, to some extent must, occur in space if humanity aims for long-term travel and settlements. Yet the limited research related to space exology has to date almost exclusively focused on reproduction. That is, research has particularly focused on the factors that may impact our sexual functions, fertility, conception, pregnancy, and development. This line of work has identified several risk factors that can impact the reproductive functions of mammals. These include radiation exposure, which can alter the DNA of cells and gametes, and in turn can be detrimental to ova and spermatozoa, as well as promote cancer formation, congenital malformations, and other developmental anomalies in the embryo, fetus, or child. These also include the gravitational, the extreme gravitational changes of liftoff, reentry, and life aboard artificial habitats, which could lead to reduced bone density, muscle atrophy, vision and nerve vestibular impairments, as well as negatively impact our hormonal and cardiovascular systems. With regards to both radiation and gravity, non-human studies have found that, for instance, Fertilization may be possible under microgravity, but normal embryo development may require a standard 1G. Both hyper and microgravity may negatively impact the motility and number of spermatozoa. Yet encouragingly, mouse freeze-dried spermatozoa could be shielded from radiation and safely stored aboard the International Space Station for extended periods of time, as well as potentially produce viable offspring. When it comes to human experiments, on the other hand, um, female astronauts tend to have their children later in life, which may increase complications. Bed rest study also found that microgravity may affect spermatogenesis, and space flight uh, may reduce testosterone levels in male subjects. That said, we know remarkably little about the overall intimacy and sexuality of astronauts, including their reproductive health. And more to the point, sexology extends far beyond reproduction. It encompasses interconnected phenomena, including, but not limited to, sexual health, anatomy, responses, and lifespan development, but also consent, pleasure, sociocultural norms, as well as everything that has to do with justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Arguably, not taking into consideration this complexity may lead to the realization of several risks beyond the hazard already described, including aboard our upcoming space stations. These include the challenges of living in extremely isolated, confined, remote, and self-sustained artificial habitats, which can be stressful and make it difficult to meet human sociosexual need, as well as require people living in space to handle dangers or emergencies in a relatively independent manner. Granted a high degree of stress characterizing such circumstances, space inhabitants may be also at greater risks of interpersonal conflicts along with, along with psychopathological issues such as anxiety and depression. They may also need to contend with being away from significant others for long periods of time, if not indefinitely. Space habitats can further limit access to compatible intimate partners, restrict privacy, and not unlike the way astronaut must relearn how to eat, groom, clean, and excrete using the adapted systems, impose strict hygiene and self-care trainings and protocols to ensure that these environments are kept viable and pleasant. In parallel, we can also reasonably expect that by regularly interacting with one another, some of the people living in close proximity for extensive periods of time will be attracted to each other, potentially fall in love, and 
develop casual or committed intimate relationships. Thus, space organizations should develop the necessary policies and protocols to contend with these situations and how they may influence the safety and effective state of astronauts, as well as mission success. Relatedly, the remoteness of space environments will impose that space inhabitants learn to comprehensively address sexual and reproductive health, ranging from, for instance, contending with infections, injuries, or dysfunctions, to all matters associated with conception, pregnancy, abortion, miscarriage, birth, and child rearing. It also means that space societies will have to carefully plan and monitor population levels and their compositions in order to keep them sustainable and avoid exceeding available resources. The same population will also need to navigate the complexity of sociocultural differences, and with that, a diversity of norms and behaviors that may lead to the emergence of new, unique, erotic space cultures. Furthermore, we can expect that humanity will bring into space the full range of its sexual preferences, orientations, identities, and relationship structures, a diversity that should be fully integrated to space programs to better contend with the risk factors associated with the lived experience of gender and sexual minorities, as well as other intersecting or marginalized groups. We can also anticipate that commercial aspects of sexuality may emerge in long-term space journeys, such as the use of erotic stimuli and technology, but also the emergence of forms of consensual sex work and more problematically forms of sexual exploitation or trafficking that by definition infringe upon human rights. Finally, based on what we know of our experiences on earth, including in the military and scientific missions, we have to assume and prepare for the enactment of some forms of sexual violence, harassment, aggression, or rape in analog or space contexts, where living and human resources may be scarce and in turn may be used to coerce people into unwanted behaviors. Importantly, we remark that many of these risks may disproportionately affect certain demographics, such as Black, Indigenous, and people of color, along with women, females, and gender or sexual minorities, such as LGBTQ plus individuals and communities. Conversely, if we actually prepare and safely facilitate the wide spectrum of human eroticism in space, we could reap its significant benefits for the health and well being of future space inhabitants. For example, enabling solitary or partnered sex can help sleep and reduce stress. It can also alleviate pain or tension, facilitate sexual functioning and satisfaction, relieve headaches, increase testosterone levels, improve self esteem and body image, strengthen pelvic floor muscles potentially protect against prostate cancer, enable pair bonding, as well as building and maintaining intimate relationships, help express affection, closeness, and nurturance, make our lives more fun, pleasurable, and worth living, and ultimately help normalize space life by enabling positive aspects of human existence outside of Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. In order to make all of this possible, we need to holistically consider the ever-changing biopsychosocial factors that may influence the future of our intimacy and sexuality in new space environments. In that regard, the biopsychosocial model of space sexology reminds us that sexuality is not just about reproduction, and reproduction in itself is not just about producing viable offspring. Based on this model, we are currently in the process of devising a preliminary roadmap that will provide us with data-driven solutions that could be gradually implemented as we proceed to settle space. This roadmap proposes that we first systematically comb through the data, reports, and anecdotes that space organization may have already directly or indirectly accumulated with regards to love, sex, and intimate relationships in space or analog context, we should, then, uh, we should then conduct in-depth interview with past and present astronauts, as well as current astronaut candidates to, in, to explore their intimate lives and sexual health prior, during, and after missions. Finally, strong with this empirical basis, 
we should then rapidly move to actual experiments. Specifically, this would entail adapting and deploying the arsenal of methods that is already used in sexology and use it to study intimacy and sexuality in analog, simulated, and whenever possible space contexts. These methods may include self-report questionnaires, interviews, and daily diaries, but also eye tracking, heart rate monitoring, EEG, penile and vaginal plasmography, as well as genital thermography to together record the subjective, attentional, neurocognitive, and sexual responses of participants. Deployed in a number of basic experiments, these methods will allow us to explore the intimate relationship and sexual health of astronauts and crews at baseline, during training, as well as during and after a mission. These methods will also allow us to investigate how intimacy and sexuality influence individuals' physical and mental well-being, crew performance, and mission success across these contexts. Once this basic knowledge is acquired, we would then move to an iterative process between phase one and phase two, where we devise and test solutions to mitigate the identified sexological risk factors and attempt to enhance intimate well being across analog, simulated, and space contexts. This may include developing screening processes to determine the best candidates to build or maintain healthy relationships in space context, policies regarding what behaviors are acceptable with who and under which circumstances, systems to facilitate sexual activities alone or in and outside of crew members, as well as protocols and trainings on how to use such systems or deal with potential human and technical issues related to space eroticism. Once we have a firm grasp on the most efficient solutions, the last step will be to invest the necessary time and resources to implement and refine said solution across the board, including as new erotic challenges and realities arise. That said, to conduct this research, we will need transdisciplinary collaborations between various experts, professionals, stakeholders, and citizens. We will also need to overcome a number of challenges, not least of which is facing the somewhat conservative norms of some space organizations and their funders, designing artificial ecosystems that are compatible with human sexuality, and ensuring the sustained cooperation of space administrators, researchers, and inhabitants when it comes to taking part in the necessary sexological research, training, and their recommendations. In that regard, we previously argued that some of these challenges may be better overcome by underlining to the public and space organizations that access to healthy sexuality is a fundamental human right. It is central to our well-being. And given the numerous previous call for research, space, or, space organization won't be able to ignore it, or at least feign ignorance. These organizations may be rather increasingly held accountable for the sexual and reproductive health of those that they take into space. So. Instead of waiting for problems to arise, we suggest that space, program, space programs align themselves with a more progressive agenda, one that actively promotes sexual rights and sex positive ethics. We also recommend that space organizations invest the necessary resources in a comprehensive research program dedicated to space sexology in order to maximize our chances of having, within the next 20 years, the required holistic knowledge to survive and thrive beyond our home planet Earth. Because ultimately, in the words of Rick Tomlinson, the darkness of ignorance so often surrounding the, sub the subject of sex must not be allowed to follow us into space. On that note, I'd like to thank my labs, collaborators, Better Futures, and of course, all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was terrific. Um, you know, we had uh, Rick Tomlinson on our show for, uh, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes yesterday, uh, talking about talking about uh, his work to develop uh, the Mir space station as a commercial site. Uh, so I uh, think, I mean, that's awesome that you just referenced him. A um, couple things to, to chat about and uh, Hey, Britt, if you want to come back on screen, you're welcome. I'm not sure. Uh, 
wh whether you were going to do that or not. Um, uh, first of all, I didn't know you were in Montreal, so um, bonjour. I, I lived in uh, Outremont for about a year, so I love it out there. Um, I, I've lived in Canada twice now, and, and uh, Montreal and Vancouver, so uh, it was really terrific living up there. Second, um, love your logo. That's very evocative. Um, uh, the uh, the astronaut in space also has a you know. A, an egg and a sperm flavor to it. So uh, element to it. So very, very nice. I, I, I thought that was really clever and, and tasteful. Um, you know, I hate to say that these are taboo topics, but for, for generations, they have been taboo topics. So uh, how did you decide this is the work that you wanted to do and how is it being received? I wish it wasn't a taboo topic. That's why we are, that's why we're doing the things that we're doing with this program. But um, uh, how did you decide on it? It takes a certain amount of courage to do it. And, and where do you expect to go with it? Just as a, as a professional. Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, how I got into it is that actually my, my PG thesis, so I got into a lab we were studying human sexuality and cognition and the neuroscience of uh, human sexuality. Uh, they were particularly interested in the development of sexual preferences. And um, so they were doing studies with humans and rats. And uh, I, I got into that lab to work uh, on the development of how technology was influencing the development of sexual preferences. And it led to a PhD thesis on aerobotics, which is the, the study of human machine erotic interaction. And when we were um, developing uh, this field and also the field of aerobotics and also thinking about the applications of new erotic technologies, uh, we rapidly realized that uh, these technology were uh, invaluable to provide access to intimacy and sexuality to uh, people in isolated, uh, remote and confined environments here on earth. But with everything that was happening uh, in the space sector, we rapidly realized that there were concrete applications to use uh, new sex tech and virtual reality, augmented realities and AI and robotics and so on uh, in space context to not only provide access to intimacy, but also help monitor the sexual and intimate health of astronauts uh, in these uh, contexts. Not only because, um, I mean, it's tough to, uh, to meet intimate needs in um, current space context, but also because sometimes we prefer to talk to a machine uh, about sensitive topics if they have to record or stinks rather than having to deal with our colleagues who uh, we're living 24 seven, who might also be our friends and, and whatnot. So we wrote a piece for the conversation called uh, Sex in Space, Could Technology Meet the Needs of Astronauts? And it, it was developing some of this idea. And we were approached by uh, the sex tech company WeVibe to produce a, a couple of months later, uh, a larger report on the use of sex tech in space, uh, which we did. And part of it is already out. Um, and after that, uh, when we were producing that, that report for uh, Wevi, we really realized that there was a lack of research, uh, of overall research, I mean, on human sexuality in space and intimacy from love, sex, uh, and intimate relationships with crew members, with outside of crew members and whatnot. Uh, so we realized that we really needed to take a step back. <laughs> we were already providing solutions uh, to, because it was just a no brainer for us that uh, sexuality is central to human existence and we should enable it rather than try to restrict it. Uh, but we realized that there was a, actually a lack of research uh, on this on overall space sexology, or as Dr. Alex Leyendecker calls it, astrosexology. Uh, I'm fine with both terms. <laughs> it's just, um, but so we took a step back and wrote the case for space sexology, realizing that other researchers before us had been calling for this, uh, this research for more than 30 years, but actually yeah. Six, yeah. seven years, 75 years almost of research in, in these areas, but clearly uh, 30 years, uh, 32 years of researchers saying, look, we have to deal with this because uh, if we want to become an interplanetary species or just um, keep our uh, sanity and uh, improve our well-being and keep our general health in space, mental and physical, uh, and not damage the reproductive health and the sexual function of astronauts also after when they come back, uh, like we have, we have to do something. <laughs> Um, but over the years, um, forced to observe that these calls for research have been systematically ignored 
uh, or if they are not being ignored, <laughs> it's it's very secret projects. That, right, right. Uh, no one, uh, that, that's always maybe like a possibility. But let's st stay with the official um, answers from space agency, which is that we don't study sexuality in space. Although they are, okay, they are studying reproductive health, Egbert uh, also emphasized it. They are keen on making sure that we don't um, affect uh, the reproductive health of humans um, as we go into space, even though there's still little research comparative to the rest, at least that they know about space medicine. Um, but it's not enough, okay, we're in 2022, um, we have plans to establish permanent settlements on the moon, whether even if it's just camping or, uh, or being a, a constant presence on Earth for long-term missions. We have plans to settle Mars. We have uh, companies like SpaceX who are building, uh, putting the building blocks to establish permanent colonies there. I mean, at some point, like we, we have to deal with it. And I'm telling you, we are right now 20 years to in it. We're yeah, we're, we're way behind the curve, way behind the curve. On this we're really beyond schedule on that, but we're facing a lot of challenges. Some people don't recognize that this is an issue. Uh, some people obviously are, I think they're dealing with very conservative infrastru infrastructure. Yeah. As, yeah. So they don't want to use taxpayers for anything that has to do with uh, sex related topics, even though it's central to human existence. People do it, enjoy it. It's born, it's born from their life. It's, um, they don't want their tax uh, dollars to go there or their investment. Um, even though it's one of the imp most important keys to unlock space, whether that be to survive and thrive outside of our own planet, but also as a literally a strategic uh, a strategic investment to enable people to function in space for long periods of time, whether they be scientists or military personnel. Uh, so, so yeah, to to a, a long a long answer for a short question, but we're facing this um, this situation where. We are way behind uh, on this investment, and there's a lot of research that could be done without um, um, large sums of money. Uh, human life scientists and sex researchers in particular are very accustomed to dealing um, with trying to find data and the triangulating data and conducting research with limited funds because it's not just the space industry in general uh, as a difficulty funding sex research, but there is a shift. and um, where I, the background I have is uh, in sex tech and the human machine erotic interaction um, kind of prepared me to, or actually uh, habituated me to deal with uh, not only the media, but conservative uh, funders and organization and sensationalist representation of human sexuality. And I'm accustomed to bring it back to look, look, this is like, this is reality. This is a this is a real problem. This is a real scientific issue. We need to deal and uh, be dealing with that. And as I bridged it to space sexology, my goal uh, as is very simple. I wanted to improve intimate human well-being as we continue to expand into the universe. That's that's the baseline. And if I can push the ball forward a little, uh, well, I can I can die a happy man. I think. Uh, and Egbert and my colleagues and I have for. Um, fortune to have met Dr. Alex Leyendecker and China Pana recently, and I hope the projects that will happen in the coming years in collaborations with these amazing individuals will help to uh, crystallize this, uh, what is now a theoretical vision and translate it into practical applications. Well, um, Pete, Pete uh, Gerritsen is blowing up the uh, chat channel here for a second. So uh, thanks, Pete, for your questions. Just pause for a moment. Um, you know, one of your slides had the Mars Desert Research Station uh, out in Utah. I've been out there uh, three times. For the record, I did not have sex out there. Uh, uh, although now, now I'm like, hmm, that that's a missed opportunity. Um, but uh, uh, you know. You know, I don't know if you've talked to the folks that are running that site, but um, uh, the Mars Society has been a pretty strong advocate of our uh, of our program, and they've been a big help, a big supporter. Um, they're going to be uh, uh, pretty primary to an event that we're having, I think, in July, where we're talking about analogs. We had uh, Dr. Nicholas Jorstad. Um, from Sweden yesterday, who's doing a lunar analog. Um, 
I, mean, I got to think that somebody hooked up somewhere. There's about 30 analog sites in, around the world. Um, so Pete's asking, you know, do we know conclusively if sex has happened in space at all? As far as I know, definitely not on the International Space Station. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, some of the old Soviet programs or anything that you're aware of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, when I said we need to review the anecdotes and reports and directly or indirectly read between the lines uh, of some of these reports. Okay. My intuition <laughs> is that there's a good chance that somewhat, okay, sexual responses are possible in space. People have erections, can be aroused in these things, first of all. Secondly, there's a good chance that something happened. That being said, I'm sticking to the official um, reports and notice partly because I am from outside uh, space organization looking in. So I have to take their words uh, for what it is. Okay. Um, so my answer is no, but <laughs> uh, there's a good chance it might. And if it, it hasn't happened yet, it should happen in the future. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So I, I, I think I'm systematically each week disappointing the media uh, <laughs> yeah. where people really, really want me to say yes, like it actually yeah. happens. And, um, but little spoiler, we're trying to make this happen. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, yeah. These are on our goals. If Egbert's goal is to actually uh, enable people to um, give birth outside of our own planet, my goal is to enable the full spectrum of intimate relationship and sexuality in space from people falling in love and maintaining relationships to having sex in space. Uh, well, the, the first married couple went to space just two days ago. They were only up there for a few minutes and they would have had to be very quick, but, uh, and there was a crowded capsule. So maybe that's not the, the, the most uh, uh, conducive environment, but that was the first married couple. And I know that there are at least three other married couples that are slated to go. Um, so what I'm very worried about, though, is that actually uh, one companies or some person uh, from the private sector or even space tourists will actually do it, do it as a stunt. OK, mm -hmm. they'll just invest rapidly a bunch of money to try to make it happen as a free for all just for right. the publicity. Look, it'd be interesting, but uh, at the same and maybe liberating and like maybe a movement of sex positiveness and that'd be fine. But I'm more worried that this will happen that way rather than planning, screening, making sure that people are aware of what they're engaging, they're prepared mentally and physically uh, for it, that they understand consent, pleasure, mutuality, respect, and make sure that um, also there's some form of anonymity uh, to this process, because as soon as this happens, these individuals will make history, okay? They'll become uh, yeah. famous from like, <laughs> <laughs> the, from the day this happens or even like the day that it's actually planned to, to happen these people their their names will be in history books on everyone's right. names and it's going to blow up the internet and, and the media uh so i'd like us to rather than wait for problems to arise or a stunt to happen that we plan carefully for it and make it happen in a very safe and ethical uh, manner that said, if a stunt happens, I'll be happy to try to find uh, the people who made it happen and collaborate to actually make studies and understand uh, how this, uh, but I'd rather not, <laughs> I'd rather that this doesn't happen that way. Right. Simon, um, I, I will connect you to Professor Dave Cohen. He's still working on this paper, um, sharing more or less exactly the same concerns. Um, so the, the, the space tour tourism sector is not addressing this responsibility uh, yet. So there's work to do here uh, as well because it's uh, it's gonna cause problems. And yeah. then it's the, the space tourism sector and the space hotels, there will be strong magnets for people that wanna perform any stunt like this. Yeah. And even for space nations that will send couples out there for, this, for that reason. They, yeah. th th those countries will be wanting to claim some unique thing, some unique stunt like that. Right. Exactly. And if it's not country, it's just individuals who will want to, to become yeah. famous uh, with these things like you're referring to space hotels. And I'm not just even like talking about space stations in uh, Leo. And, uh, I'm thinking about also like these balloons and like companies who are developing these. Uh, yeah. This just, perspective uh, this program is, uh, is a multi-hour trip. It's a four or five hour flight with plenty of room to spare. There's a lot of real estate up there. So 
that yeah. might, I mean, they won't be in space, but it would still be uh, probably a much more conducive environment. I'll just leave it at that. Um, we we're a little bit behind schedule, which I hardly ever get. Uh, I'm hardly ever behind. So we're going to bring in um, uh, Tommaso here and then we're going to wrap this session up at the end with more Q&A. Uh, Simon, if you wouldn't mind jumping into the chat and typing up some answers to uh, to to Garrettson, uh, he's got some great questions uh, that I think we're all looking forward to the answer on. Uh, Tommaso, thank you, sir, for uh, joining us on short notice. Um, let me uh, read your your bio and you know shout out to a former ISUer. Um, let's let's go build Starfleet together. Um, uh, Tommaso, diverse background in ISU alumnus, uh, space design com competition organizer and volunteer presented an innovative propulsion system at IAC 21, experience working in two space startups currently involved with frontier space technologies uh, with business development and drag sail technology development. Uh, Tommaso, I don't know very much about you. Uh, Avery just brought you to my attention this morning. So uh, you're mostly a mystery to me, but I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks for, thanks for being here. And thank you everyone for, for inviting me and giving us this you know, opportunity to um, know each other. So yeah, I'm, I'm Tommaso, Tommaso Tonina. Um, as a, a training, I'm a space engineer. Um, and also I spent part of my studies on astronautics. Um, I'm very happy to be here and um, to meet you all. Um, I know a little bit about Spaceborne um, and what uh, Edward uh, has, been, has been doing. We've met already. Um, but yeah, um, I'll briefly um, talk about um, about uh, Frontier Space Technologies. That is the company that um, I'm working um, at at the moment. And uh, yeah, can I can I share my screen? Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, Frontier Space Technologies is a, a Cranfield University um, spin-off company. Um, that is currently um, um, solving or tackling uh, two problems in space. Um, today we'll have a brief look at how uh, our company is supporting human activities in, in space. So um, at Frontier, uh, we have developed two main products. Um, one is a customizable uh, platform for autonomous uh, biomedical research in space and I see a lot of synergy um, with um, the topics we are talking about today. Um, and we'll get into details uh, in a few slides. And the other one, uh, the other product is targeting um, um, sustainability of human activities in space um, with a compact uh, and simple drag set. So um, there are Two, the two problems we're addressing are on the left, you can see accessibility and on the, on the right, you see space debris. Um, so as you all know, at the moment, we have very limited capability in terms of research in space. Um, all the research we are doing is very expensive. Um, however, there are huge opportunities for biomedical research to be performed uh, in space. We know um, that space is a unique environment uh, that allows um, incredible advancement in many fields related to uh, life sciences and biomedical pharmaceutical research. Um, the other side of our uh, company um, is developing a, dr a drag cell, as we, as we uh, discussed already. So especially in low Earth orbit, um, we know that in the coming years, uh, the number of operating satellites will increase. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, a very important aspect is understanding that deorbiting these uh, satellites when they finish their, their mission uh, cheaply and quickly um, is, is incredibly important now, but it will become even more important in the years to come. So these are the two, the two products. Uh, you see on the left, the BioCubeSat, uh, on, on the right, the drag sale. Uh, the BioCubeSat, um, just to give you an idea, it's a 2U uh, uh, satellite. Um, that contains um, a pro pro uh, proprietary uh, multi-disc chamber 
you know, um, um, microfluidic system and microscope. It's capable of working fully autonomously. Um, and you see uh, the picture you see at the top left, it's, uh, it's a picture taken during the BEXIS um, uh, program in 2021. Uh, it was a program where there was uh, uh, our payload with other universities uh, research hardware attached to a stratospheric balloon that was um, yeah, brought up into the atmosphere. On the right side, you see um, two pictures. Uh, the bottom one is a parabolic flight um, where a different drag cell design was uh, testing, was getting tested in weightlessness. Um, and then on the top right, uh, you see a, um, a picture of one of our drag cell deployed. Um, as, far as, I, uh, as far as I remember, we have three missions uh, with our drag cell already um, deployed that are currently deorbiting. So um, value proposition, um, biomedical research in space um, has several advantages uh, in many fields, um, for example, protein crystallization or drug development, um, organ and tissue development, and so on. So everything, that, uh, everything related to biomedical research that can be done in space uh, has several advantages in terms of uh, research and benefits on Earth. Um, our products have several key advantages that make them stand out in the market. Um, and in most cases, we have greater capabilities in very in compact uh, devices. And in both cases, um, the price is lower than um, similar products for, from other companies. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to read, obviously, the, the slide, but the, these are the key, um, um, the key benefits of our products. So um, in terms of funding, uh, we're currently developing um, on two funding uh, opportunities to uh, further um, advance the TRL, so the technology readiness level of our true products, uh, so the CubeSat and the Draxel. Um, the one that you see on the right is referred to um, two different uh, match funding uh, opportunities we're currently working on uh, this year. Uh, what have we have achieved uh, till now? So, um, we had the pleasure of building a great synergy with Entrepreneur Spark and with the UK Space Agency. Um, they gave us a huge support in various occasions. Um, we're actually at the moment finalizing the contract with our first client uh, for a custom uh, bike soup, CubeSat, uh, but obviously uh, with any other, uh, as with any other startup, uh, there is much more to come in, in the short, uh, short term future. So yeah, this is our core team. Um, all of us are Cranfield uh, alumni. Um, and um, I think most of us met during the BEXIS program uh, that has been running in Cranfield for several years. Uh, the picture you saw previously, so the 2021 uh, BEXIS launch was actually a launch plan for previous years, but COVID made it um, impossible. Again, um, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I kept it uh, quick and short uh, so we can have more time to discuss um, any question you might have. Uh, but it was a pleasure uh, meeting you and having this opportunity. So yeah, thanks a lot. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm actually gonna switch this to Egbert for a second. Can you describe your relationship with Cranfield? Because I think that's probably relevant. Uh, sure. And then we'll and then we'll and then we'll bring uh, you know, start talking to Tomas a little bit. Yeah. So um, in the early days of Spaceboy United, some uh, more than a little bit more than four years ago, I met Professor uh, Dave Cullen uh, in the uh, Bremen Space Expo in Germany, and that's where we we had our first connection and we, we showed interest in what we we're doing, and he thought we would have uh, mutual benefits in in in, in um, Exploring collaborations, and, and, and that's from that moment on, we we, we started to to be engaged in in, in uh, the research projects that we did together with with him and also uh, uh, graduation students. Uh, so that's up. Uh, that's been like four years ago. Uh, pretty soon, I also met uh, the colleague of Tommaso uh, Akil. Um, so I've been seeing his progress and and the progress of his team. Uh, for a long time already and uh, 
I, I, I mean, I lost track a little bit during the last year, but then Dave Cohen uh, reconnected us because he knew that what we were trying to make, they would be an excellent uh, partner in that. And then uh, things went uh, further. Um, so I visited uh, Cranfield a couple of times um, and we'll be visiting a lot more. Thanks. Um, so also, can you bring up your slides uh, for a minute? There's a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, definitely. It was, uh, about slide number three or four, perhaps. Is it this slide or this one? Uh, yeah, um, let, let's, let's jump, let's spend a little bit of time on the, uh, on, on the CubeSat here. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about it in a little bit more detail? Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe specifically, like I think the drag sales are cool, but I'm not, I'm not, that's, that's not really our topic today. So, I mean, I think they're really cool, but that's not really our topic. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, can you j dive a little further into the CubeSat and um, uh, talk about, you know, timelines, budgets, I'm not sure what you're able to talk about, but mm -hmm. I would like a little bit more detail, um, yeah. you know, what you want to accomplish, timelines and budgets, if you can, if you can go a little further than that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, um, yeah, let's start with a little bit of more detail about the product itself. Uh, so we said it's a 2U CubeSat, so it's a 10, 10 centimeter by 10 by 20. So it's pretty compact. Um, inside you can find... Um, most of the stuff that is needed to do uh, research in, in space. Um, and as we said, you know, microscope and, and, and chamber and microfluidics. So just to give you an example, um, at the moment we have 32 chambers. Uh, it means that in any chamber you have a different um, um, population. So you can grow uh, anything from, you know, bacteria to um, um, single cell um, organisms and, and, and stuff like that. Um, with the microfluidic system, um, it's possible to um, stop uh, the metabolism, for example, or to yeah to pause it, um, to give nutrients, uh, to um, uh, induce any kind of drug to the uh, population itself. Um, so this is this is the kind of uh, activity that can be done. What you see in the picture, it's uh, uh, the device attached to the balloon. So in this case, we weren't um, providing the power and the communication um, to, to fully be um, in, in operations, but it can be actually um, used um, independently. So it can orbit around the earth without anything attached. Um, being fully autonomous, it means that uh, the microscope can send uh, pictures and videos back to earth. Um, and, um, at the moment, it doesn't have any capabilities of uh, uh, recovering uh, the, the, the payload uh, autonomously. Um, if we want to do that, we need to uh, partner up with, uh, um, yeah, with other entities to ensure that the payload is safely brought back to, to Earth. So um, let, let me know if you have any other question related to uh, capabilities uh, or is, is it clear? No, that, that's clear, that's clear. Um, okay. Way, uh, uh, I'm presuming just from your location that this was a, an ESA flight, an ESA balloon flight. Um, it's it's a partner, um, yeah. So it's ESA, uh, DLR, and uh, um, uh, uh, Swedish uh, Swedish space um, um, organization. I think it's called. Yeah, it's a Bexus. Um, so it's a balloon experiment for university students, and Bexus is also run by ESA. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I bring it up, you know, I, I don't want to like drill totally into this, but uh, no my, uh, uh, you know, the work that we did by uh, uh, you know, working on the uh, Earth elevator first and then the, the lunar space elevator, uh, I've got a, I got a bunch of robots that we uh, sent up a mile into the sky with, you know, the, the big robot climbed a mile into the sky on a, mm -hmm. on a tethered balloon. And I'm always interested when I see um, balloon experiments, like, you know, they, I, I think they're, I think they have a lot of value. So I was, I, I, I saw that and I just kind of like paused. I was curious about that. So very cool. Um, 
Yeah, this uh, this was a 30 kilometers uh, flight, okay. so a little bit higher than a mile. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the principle is the same. So uh, being easy to um, uh, plan and a lot cheaper than than a suborbital or orbital uh, flight. You said 30 kilometers. That's 30, 30 yeah. miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, really neat. Really neat stuff. Um, uh, and then, uh, Abra, how does this tie in specifically? Like where, you know, you showed your, your roadmap of development. You know, this is on the ver very early side. So wh where does this tie into your, your, uh, your program? Yeah, so... Um... There are two things that we want to address. Uh, the first one is that uh, the UK Space Agency um, is um, um, uh, investing a lot of efforts into making sure of building a sustainable space sector from all uh, aspects. And biomedical research in space is one of them um, where they want to uh, increase their capability. So this is one side. On the other side, um, in the UK, there is a... Um, a big community of uh, academic research in these fields. Um, and, and therefore, the, the other side of our operation is uh, very much related to um, several universities in the UK that are uh, doing research here. So these are the two sides, space agency and, and the academic world. And you're primarily funded via the agencies? Yeah, at the moment we, we received uh, several grants and um, different funding op opportunities. Um, at the moment, most of them are from space agencies, uh, yes, uh, but obviously we're working for um, um, yeah, signing contract with, with the first clients uh, as well, yeah. Good, good, good. I, I've been long convinced that, uh, that the work that we do in space has applications down here on the ground. So I love seeing that, uh, you know, maybe maybe the space agencies are catalysts, but uh, but that the commercial sector really drives things. So I, I hope that that I hope that's definitely true for you all. and it's moving very fast, and that's why we think our platform is important because uh, I don't think we're um, very sure about uh, you know the full capabilities uh, in terms of research outcomes. So we will simply want to develop something. Uh, to be to to allow any other company or research organization to actually do some some research, yeah, yeah. Uh, when when you say it's moving very fast, what do you mean? Ah, uh, there are many companies that have already spent um, a considerable high amount of money into um, biomedical research in space. If we just consider, um, you know, the, the all the activity that we saw in the on the International Space Station, where uh, I think. Um, I, don't quote me on that, but I think that um, more than half of the experiments done on board are related to, you know, life sciences and, and biomedical stuff. Um, it makes uh, it makes it clear that there is a, a real interest in this uh, in this field. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, we had Laura Forsick on our show yesterday. Um, she's a she runs her own business as an analyst now. Uh, focusing on space stations, but her prior work about four years ago was, uh, she was one of the gatekeepers to the Air National Space Station, uh, you know, who, whose experiments were going to go, and the strong, strong, strong bias was in biotech research. Yeah. Uh, I know because um, I tried getting some material sciences uh, experiments uh it, onto the station and that was like nope we're looking for biotech work so and uh, and that's why platform like ours is very important because we definitely understand that uh, the iss capabilities are limited and the astronaut time is very expensive so we want to build something to expand the capability but also autonomous so don't we don't need someone there doing the experiment so i hope that your material research will be uh, possible uh, very soon yeah. Uh, your your system has not flown actually to space yet, correct? Uh, no, not not no. yet. Um, if we're talking about the biocubes, no, no. Yeah. Uh, what's uh, what's the time frame? What's uh, how much? Frankly, how much money do you need to make that happen? Um, so we are currently working on two um, opportunities in in the next years. One is going to be this year. Uh, the other one, uh, twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four. 
in terms of money, it very much depends if we're going suborbital. In that case, we are um, already capable of doing that. Uh, if we're going orbital, uh, in that case, uh, we need a little bit of funding. If we go back to um, this slide, yeah, this one. Uh, so just just a um, little bit than, than a million pounds for right. the BioCubeSat. Um, yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's actually not that bad um, by by comparison to other other space budgets. Uh, God, you could practically uh, hold a bake sale to put that one together. Um, there there are other projects that are a lot more expensive, so that's that's definitely very cool. definitely yeah. yeah, very cool, very cool. Okay, I'm going to bring in all of our guests uh, back on screen, and we're just going to have a bit of a, a panel with Egbert and Simon. Um, uh, before we bring in Simon, uh, Egbert, I would like a little bit of clarity of where does, where does an experimental tool like the BioCubeSat fit in your overall program and plan uh, it's on the it's on the earliest stages correct or is it an ongoing uh, element no it, it, it's on the uh, um, they're helping us to uh, to manufacture um, our IVF device which is pretty similar to what they have already done what Tommaso describes so that's where why professor Cullen uh, made this match like what you're trying to do is really uh, uh, well similar. Um, so we, we we will have the first early prototype in suborbital uh, space flights in uh, uh, in September, maybe October. Um, Simon, are you still here? Terrific, thank you, sir. Um, all right, so we're going to wrap up in the next fifteen minutes for this segment. Uh, I've said over and over and over again that that babies in space uh, is the holy grail, right? Like um, uh, Peter and I know each other because of his big idea, not his, but he was you know a, a key author of a big idea of space-based solar power. I'm looking at uh, elevators, folks are looking at uh, Martian settlement, lunar settlement, um, giant space stations. Everybody's trying to build hardware. And, and that's great. I, I'm, I'm a fan. I want that stuff to exist. I, I, you know, that hardware is necessary for us to build out that, that, uh, that ecosystem. But then y'all come along and whether you're trying to do it, um, clinically in the lab or the natural process that most of us have, have been conceived in. Um, at the end of the day, y'all are trying to do something that I call the holy grail problem of space, which is really officially move humanity off of this world and out into the solar system, potentially to other stars. I know folks working on starships. Um, why? I would like to hear your personal reasons why this stuff matters. Because um, uh, I think the world needs to hear that this stuff is real, relevant, timely, and, and possible, right? So, so why, why are you risking your careers? Because this, this is a risky move that you're all making. Um, wh why, why do this? Why do, and, and uh, I'm going to let Egbert go first because I kind of know his answer. But why? Uh, yeah. Why? Two, why two reasons. L let me start with the, with the positive reason. Um, I think uh, human life, uh, human consciousness will, will improve by becoming a multiplanetary species. I think um, uh, life on Earth will improve greatly if we reach other other planets, if we have uh, other human settlements, we, we, we can, uh, it, it, it will uh, accelerate all the other activities uh, beyond Earth. Um, all the scarce minerals and materials that are on, on asteroids 
we the way we we, we harvest them on Earth is, is very polluting, etc., very uh, devastating. So there are a lot of opportunities for for a better life on Earth if we uh, accelerate uh, space exploration. So th those are the, the 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 key positive reasons. But there is also a little bit of a fear-based reason, but I'm, I'm afraid it's a realistic reason. I think it would be good that we, that humanity would have a backup plan. Of course, 99.9% .9 of all the talents we have on Earth, all the, 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 the energy and, and resources should be focused and should remain focused on saving the Earth as a, as, as, as a, as a place for human life. But we should also spend a little bit of, of, of those talents and resources on a backup plan. I mean, in, just in, in, in this decade, we have seen three major threats to life on Earth. Um, a pandem uh, glo global pandemics, COVID, uh, nuclear threats. It's still, as we speak, it could be a threat. Uh, global warming. Um, and, and still there are some events uh, from outer space, even asteroid collisions or on Earth, supervolcano eruptions. There is a growing list of, of realistic threats to life on Earth. Like, like the famous, um, um, what's his name? He's so famous, I forgot his name. Um, <laughs> Machu, uh, um, Michu Kaku, yeah. Um, like he says, why are the, did the dinosaurs uh, go extinct? Because they didn't have a space program. Uh, if you want to be... If you don't want to go extinct, you, you need to, to be a multi-planetary species. So that's the, the little bit more fear-based negative uh, reason. But I think it's, it's becoming more and more realistic that we, we should also work on a backup plan. Cool. Uh, Simon, Tommaso? Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree. It's to survive, thrive, expand life and consciousness in the cosmos. But in, for me, it's also just about improving intimate um, and sexual well-being. It's just about improving human well-being as we continue to expand among the stars. And um, I'm kind of tired also that sexology is always first to mind and first uh, central aspects of human sexuality, but somehow always um, second uh, in thought when it comes to dealing with the big social um, changes that we're dealing with, whether that be on the side of technology or on the side of space exploration. So I'm my goal is also to just bring sexology to the 21st century to deal with uh, these upcoming challenges. Beautiful, brilliant. Tommaso? Yeah, so the, the question you're asking, um, you know, why are we risking our career into this right. big bet of, uh, you know, space, uh, space expansion, let's say. Um, I always use this metaphor when I'm talking with uh, uh, people that are working outside the space sector. I always tell them it's like we are living on a very small island in the middle of the sea, but we see that there are a lot of continents next to us and full of opportunities, and, but we're, we're not tapping into, into, um, into this. So I always ask them, are you really willing to stay on this small island forever or will you, you know, one day take a small boat and, and visit these other places that are, you know, literally next to you. So I think this helps uh, into uh, building a kind of a perspective into the general public. Brilliant. You know, it's almost uh, each of you in your own way added an element of poetry to this morning. So I, I'm really grateful. I like that a lot. Uh, I always ask my guests, um, you know, what does the future look like? So bring out your crystal ball, imagine what the future looks like. And we're gonna look at, at three very specific time zones, time epochs. Um, now to 2025, so just three short years away. And then something's going to happen in those three years. And that's gonna lead us to from 25 to 30. And then something's gonna happen in those five years and then that's going to get us to 2035. So I would like to have some three predictions about now to 2025, 25 to 30. And what I'm really looking for is where are we in 2035? So uh, I'd love to get those predictions. 
And uh, I want to capture that. So I'm totally going to put you on the spot here and we're going to come back in, in, in almost 15 years and, and check, your, check your math. So I want your verbal answers, but I also want you to just write a, a short, brief answer in the chat. So we have it as, as, as a captured statement. Uh, 2025, who wants to go first? Well, it's my turn, I guess. Okay. 2025. Um, that's kind of just tricky, ambitious in terms of would we have the first human uh, conception in space? Um, but it should be possible. So let me just, I, I, I like to dream big. I like to plan big. So my prediction will be the very first human conception in space in history. Um, I, 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 IBF conception via, yeah. okay, medically, medically developed. Uh, all right, okay, all right, in the next three years. Um, exactly, and in, in, in uh, 20, uh, 2025 to 2030, we will have the first human baby born on Earth that was conceived in space. Born on Earth, back in the maternity lab, a maternity ward that was conceived in space. Okay. Exactly. All right. Okay. 30 to 35. It should be possible that we will have the first human baby born in space. And that would be, no. you think that's an orbital facility, probably. Um, it's a 24-hour mission. Okay. So it could be about 12 hour mission, our time. experts say, but that's, um, um, so uh, the first human child uh, born in space. Okay. For right. official alien. <laughs> Artificial alien. <laughs> oh, I love What's that. gonna be in the passport, place of birth? Yeah, yeah right, what is gonna nice. be? Uh, you know, we talked a lot about, um, jurisdictions yesterday when we were talking to uh, Professor Hanlon and uh, you know she was talking about how do you you know what if you sue somebody but jurisdiction on a passport that's a whole different problem that that's uh, thank God we have we have 12 13 years to uh, solve that problem because we don't have that problem we don't have that solution just yet. So, All right, yeah. uh, Egbert, thank you. Uh, make sure you post your, your predictions yeah. in the chat, please. Um, Simon, 2025, 2030, 2035. Um, I'm, so, I'm watching you smile. You're like, well, sorry. like you're it's excited. Really hopeful predictions. Uh, I've posted it for everyone. I think by 2025, um, sex and space will have happened. Whether that be solitary masturbation or, um, or partnered sex, uh, it will be official, <laughs> officially uh, confirmed. Or uh, none of the astronauts have ever called home. Had a okay. I mean, not even a video chat. Okay. I, I think either by twenty twenty five, one astronaut will confirm. By then, someone will like, confirm that officially. Like yes, uh, either through interviews, either through our uh, research, and ideally, I think yeah, maybe partnered sex also will happen in space. Whether that be virtual, like through a distance or between partners, really uh, aboard a, a space station or for a stunt <laughs> during something that happens. I, I think that's there's so much interest with what's going on with the space sector and there's a lot of media attention when it comes to sex in space. Someone somewhere will just try to make this happen, uh, right. whether that be safely or just as like, let's, let's do a publicity stunt. Um, 2030, uh, I think I agree with Egbert. I think it will be uh, definitely possible by then to conceive uh, using assistive technology, um, like um, by 2030 uh, in space, and then bring it back and actually have the pregnancy and uh, childbirth here on Earth. By 2035, and that's really like again, <laughs> more we go in the future, the more uncertain it is. This is really contingent upon the fact that we actually invest the necessary resources uh, in the next 10 years, uh, which is doubtful, <laughs> but I think there is a lot of interest and there is a, a shift in mentality and some of the younger generations of students that I talked to at ISU or coming out, uh, they recognize that this is important and they're seeing the deadline for space colonization on Mars approaching and sending long duration missions. They are increasingly recognizing, especially with, because of the pandemic, 
because they've been stuck at home with less access to intimate partners. And they're recognizing like, okay, if we put people on the long-term space mission, it's, it's not viable uh, that uh, we don't deal with that. So I, I think there's, there may be a chance that by 2035, um, someone is born in space. Uh, whether um, and probably in this case as a like an experimental space medicine let's prove of concept uh, prove the concept of this is possible and safe um, yeah well I did not think anyone was going to say a baby born in the next 12 years in space I, I have to say I'm really surprised by that Tommaso um, so um, first of all um, I'll take the freedom to talk um uh, on a different topic than what I discussed today. Um, and I'm very hopeful. So probably my um, silly predictions are going to be wrong, but I'll, I'll talk about them anyway. So you said by 2025. So my guess is that we will not have a huge improvements in terms of space capability simply because it's like two years and a half from now. Um, but hopefully we'll have um, a similar kind of international space station on the moon. So the idea of having astronauts um, um, constantly present, present on, the, on the lunar surface would be interesting. Um, if we talk about you know, 2025 to 30, um, my big hope is that in situ resource utilization will be a key topic in, in at least in lunar activities. So for example, extracting water for human activities, um, you know, sustaining life uh, or breathing, uh, but also uh, producing um, propellants, so hydrogen or oxygen one of them or both of them, uh, basically. Um, and for Mars, I hope that, um, you know, further testing will be, will be done. I know we are doing it, um, but uh, not from a commercial point of view. Uh, by 35, um, I don't know, um, probably uh, civilians on the moon. So a kind of um, colony on the moon with uh, non-astronauts and similar to what we are planning on doing right now on the moon, but on Mars. So, uh, a stable um, a research outpost for astronauts on, on Mars. But yeah, this oh, is it. That's awesome. I, I love that. It's one of the reasons why I really love this series. Um, in a couple months, we're not quite ready to, to launch it yet. We're going to be hosting a, uh, a different series. So this one, this series, uh, the Starfleet Enterprise is really focused on space stations. And uh, in a few months, uh, in two months, we're going to have one focused on money and space capitalization and finance. Uh, that's May 25th and 26th. And then towards the end of summer, July-ish, we're going to start our series focused on the future. And so we're going to bring in all of these hardware folks that are writing real checks and and building real hardware. And I'm going to put the same question to them now that 2025, 25 to 30, 30 to 35, and identifying um, all the infrastructure that's there. And then folks like you have to fill in the blank. Like, okay, if we, if we build the systems, then what? Right. And, and so um, that, that, that's, that's our, that's our plan for this year uh, as we build out our speaker series. Um, Fascinating topics, y'all. Really appreciate it. Um, Simon from Montreal. Tommaso, you're in Spain, correct? Spain? Yep, I'm, yep, I'm based in Spain in the, in the Canary Islands, yeah. And then uh, Egbert from the, from the Netherlands. So love, love that we bring like kind of global leadership to this, to this table. I think that's really important. Um, uh, I'm in a I'm going to fly my ISU flag for a second and say that it's stuff like this that makes me think that building Starfleet is real. Like we can, we can do this if we work together globally and collaboratively. So uh, thanks a lot, y'all. Really, really great having you. Uh, fantastic conversation. Tons of follow-up here. Um, and with that, I'm going to switch gears. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, y'all. Um, Tommaso, did you did you put your did you put your guesses in? No, 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 no. You can't leave yet. No, so. I'm writing them down. Okay. I just All right. Okay. Thank All you right. everyone. I was about to about to say thanks a lot. Appreciate your time, but uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta get that you gotta get that in because I'm really trying to collect. I think this data is important, right? Like in a real way, in a very real way, 
um, the folks in this Better Futures series, uh, you know, the money folks, the lunar development folks, the future folks, and then and then the space station and, and babies folks, um, they are leaders in this global effort to go to space, you know, a human effort, a global human effort to go to space. Uh, and so I'm really trying to be systematic about capturing this data from this time period. And then where are we, you know, five years from now, look back to us now and, and see. So especially discovered that all our prediction were false and we are twin years. And <laughs> well, I mean, look, all of the sci-fi behind me has yeah. been saying that where we are today is 30 years behind where these folks thought we were going to be, right? But the 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 curve here is like this, right? It's a straight up hockey stick curve that um, we had to go through those dull days and, and not no slight to the, to the Apollo program or, or the Soviets or, or even the Chinese. Like we, we had to go through this kind of learning curve, but now we're at this hockey stick growth point where um, we really cannot make good useful predictions that far out 12 years out 13 years out we just we can't make good useful predictions anymore because things are changing so fast but we got to have a starting point and this is our starting point so thanks. yeah thanks um appreciate appreciate that all right y'all we're going to switch gears thanks very much uh we're going to be you know closing out the day here uh, a bit here in a moment um the uh the program Next month is going to be pretty interesting. Um, I can't name them yet. Uh, I'm really excited about what I can't tell you about right now. Um, in the last few hours and yesterday, uh, I've had um, some really fun conversations with, with some sci-fi authors that are on my shelf behind me, folks that I've been a fan of for for decades um uh and what we're gonna have next month should be really awesome um i don't have confirmations i have indications of interest so i want to be really clear like i'm not i'm not lying to anybody we don't have any agreements yet but i think we're gonna have some really great sci-fi authors and we're gonna have some astronauts i really sincerely hope uh, i actually said that last month and it didn't turn out that way. So this month, uh, instead of talking about um, the fact and fiction of going to orbit, uh, we really talked a lot about the moon. That was mostly yesterday's program. Um, but next month, I believe that we're going to have some sci-fi authors talking about their visions of the future. And then the astronauts who actually went to space, uh, I had a conversation with, uh, with one of them a couple days ago and another one um, uh, early, early last month. Um, so my hope is that we're gonna have some science fiction authors talking about their predictions, uh, their imagination of what the future was gonna look like. And then we're gonna compare and contrast that with actual astronauts who have actually gone to orbit, who have actually gone to, uh, to the space station or, or flown um, suborbitally. So I think that should be a pretty powerful and interesting conversation. Um, as always, we have our babies in space component where Egbert and his team will come back. Uh, as we are, as we are building this program as this Better Futures series is expanding and evolving. Um, it's been great. It's been really fun. You know, we've done, this is now our 19th program, but only our third under our own banner. Um, for folks who have listened before, uh, the first 16 events were under contract, whether it was for the um, uh, Moon Society, Mars Coin, uh, 
uh, Air National Space University, uh, chief scientist of US Space Force, and especially the uh, uh, Foundation for the Future. We did, we did 16 events under contract for other organizations, but at the beginning of this year, we made the decision that we were going to really focus on building our own programming, our own series, focused on the things that we at Liftport care about. So there's a space stations topic, right? So how do we build uh, a platform for humanity that's, that, that can support 15,000 people, right? That's an arbitrary number, but the, whether that's 15,000 in uh, 100 different space stations or a large settlement on the moon and Mars, however that plays out, how do we build a giant uh, um, center of civilization off world? So that's one element. Another is uh, the Space Investment Summit. Uh, that's gonna be sponsored by the uh, Center for Space uh, Commerce and Finance. Um, we're looking at money, you know, this stuff, uh, it, it's been famously, used, the, the line has been famously used, I think by uh, Krantz, um, without bucks, there's no Buck Rogers, right? And so how do we pay for this stuff that we're all dreaming about? And, and if you don't look at the money, you probably can't build the things you want to build. Um, lunar settlement, uh, because we're building an elevator on the moon. So lunar settlement is especially important to me. But, you know, considering Martian settlement as well. Um, and finally, the, the series I just described, 2035, the future 2035, um, you know, systematically evaluating the uh, steps, the hardware, the infrastructure necessary to get us to that point. Um, so really, really fun stuff that, that we're building here at Liftport. Um, and that's, that's the driver, you know, that's the financial driver for our research. Now this series is a new series. And so it is not economically strong yet. Uh, we have some great partners. We have some good alliances, really happy to have the support of, um, uh, uh, Aries Studios and the Axonar community, that's uh, 110,000 strong um, uh, YouTube community, uh, having, the, having the support of um, the Mars Society, National Space Society, Space Frontier Foundation. Uh, you know, those folks have been instrumental to our growth and success. Um, and, and I just mentioned the Center for Space, Commerce and Finance. So having these organizations support us and build out uh, this community, it's, it's, really, it's really important. And, and, and the result of it is that we get to build an elevator on the moon, right? So um, that's a long-term proposition. It's not easy. It's gonna take a lot of time. It's definitely gonna take a lot of capital. But as we build our audience, as we build our community, as we build our revenues, we become better able to go after that big idea. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, yesterday I talked to, uh, quite a bit about our company and our organization. Um, uh, there's there's um, four of us full-time, uh, the Fifth, one, fifth person joins us next week. And then we have a part-time uh, person as well. So we are growing. It's, uh, it's bumpy, it's complicated, it's not easy, but we are growing. Um, and then what does that allow us to do, right? So, so yesterday I talked a little bit about our company. Today, I'm really gonna focus on the lunar elevator itself. So um, by way of history, started on the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts Research team um, back in 2001, uh, stuck with it until 2003 when that, when that project ended, uh, created Liftport, uh, the first version of Liftport Group in those early days, really focused on the 
earth elevator. So a little while ago, I showed a bunch of um, robots. We got pretty good at the robotic technology of climbing up and down string, and we worked really hard, but we're ultimately unsuccessful uh, trying to build a super strong string out of carbon nanotube technology. Um, so that was our history. We went out of business in 2007. We briefly came back to life in 2012 with, uh, with a Kickstarter project. Um, I mentioned that yesterday as well. Uh, and then um, it wasn't until a few years ago, 2017, that we became officially building ourselves as a real company again. Um, and that's been pretty exciting. Certainly through the COVID days, that was very bumpy. That's one of the reasons why we started doing the, um, the conferences as a service and how we evolved to this. So we've had to be uh, pretty nimble. Uh, we've have had to react to good days and bad days. Um, but all throughout that time, going back nearly 20, uh, over 20 years now, um, the elevator, whether the earth version or now the lunar version has always been the prior, primary task, the primary focus. Um, and with that, uh, we, we were not doing lunar elevator research for a really long time. We were trying to just stay alive as a company, as an organization. Um, and we did, we did. So, you know, kudos to my team. I have, an, I have a tremendous team and without them, we couldn't have survived this. Um, but we are beginning to look towards what's next for us uh, and and yes the better futures platform and that product line that we're building is necessary to uh, our revenues but then what do we spend our revenues on right we spend it on building the lunar elevators so um we're we're not flush yet i don't want to mislead anybody um, but we are starting to look at what can we do over this, uh, you know, the beginning of spring where we are now into summer, into fall and into the end of the year. Um, the things that we're going to be focusing on, uh, are materials. Materials are the first thing. Um, uh, we would like to do some down select processes. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we know that there are 14 candidate materials that are all strong enough for the lunar elevator. Um, some of them are better than others. There's none that are Goldilocks or just right. Um, and so we recently had a study performed um, I cannot, I cannot release that study. I'd like to, it's not, uh, it's not the spot where it can be released, but it did give us some really good information. Um, and what it looks like is there's, there's 14 materials that are all strong enough to build the elevator. The strength actually isn't the problem. We've known that for a long time. Uh, the problems are in uh, how do those materials react to the space environment, the very, very hostile space environment? So some of those, some of those materials expand and contract. There's a lot of creep. There's a lot of thermal de degradation. Uh, UV, ultraviolet light has a problem. Radiation, all of those things. So um, we are looking pretty closely at what are our materials requirements. We do intend to put a, uh, a few proposals out there, uh, sorry, a few um, grant, grant proposals out uh, along those lines. That'll be towards the end of summer into fall. Um, and with that, we'll know more about the materials requirement. So that's one element that we're looking at. The second one, uh, pending funding, is to uh, maybe maybe once again restart working on our robotics technologies. So um, 
my hope is that we can recreate the robot that I just showed here a moment ago, uh, that one right there, recreate it um, with modern tech. That robot was built uh, 15 years ago, if you can believe that, that robot's 15 years old. Um, we want to recreate it just as it is, and then from there start expanding it. Um, so those are some of the early next steps that we're looking at um, down the road into next year, assuming that those two things work, uh, we're gonna be looking at um, uh, flights, uh, some CubeSat developments, uh, again, testing materials, and then uh, flights eventually out to the Lagrange point. So that's our, uh, that's our short-term pieces. Um, there's definitely more to share on that. I'm hoping that as this event series evolves, uh, as we gain some success internally, we'll be sharing those up updates uh, over the course of the next year. Um, I think that's all I've got to announce right now. Uh, uh, for those of y'all that know me, uh, I got burned pretty bad by the earth elevator and making a lot of pronouncements uh, in advance of things. And I've really learned that lesson the hard way. So I'm only going to tell you about the things we've accomplished, not about the things we want to do. Um, but the stuff that we're working on now, the materials and the robotics, I, I feel very confident in, in sharing a bit about that. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite everybody to our Discord channel. I'm going to post the link here in a moment um, uh, where we are talking about, you know, the next 28 days, right? Uh, oops, I'm just posting the wrong link here. Um, And, and what I mean by the next 28 days is that we host this event. It's a two day event. Great. Tons of work goes into building this event, but then what, what happens after that? So we call that the other 28 days. And our hope is that we build a community that we build uh, reach and that folks want to start working on some of the problems that we identify in this, uh, uh, in this community that we're building. And so um, if that's if that's interesting to y'all, if you want to, you know, uh, get involved with that, that, that effort, uh, we'd love to, we'd love to have your support. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close. I want to, I want to thank my, my team, my, my newest intern, Gion, my, uh, my long time a uh, friend uh, and, and team member, um, Fabio. Uh, we've got a new intern joining us next week, um, Young En. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure working with y'all. I couldn't, I couldn't do this stuff without y'all. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out the day and I'll see y'all next month. Next month uh, we go, uh, it's, it's uh, let me make sure I've got my dates correct. Um, ba, ba, ba. Um, yeah, next month is May 6th and 7th. Um, we're going to take our discount codes and, and pass, them, pass them on to everybody. Uh, really like, how this is evolving and, and getting people uh, uh, connected here. So um, definitely you wanna join us next month. We're gonna be doing this, uh, this topic again of uh, the science and fiction of living on orbit. I think it's gonna be super exciting to have astronauts and science fiction authors uh, coming together. Looking forward into June and July and August, we're gonna be talking about requirements, architecture, feasibility, and trades, analog research sites, environmental controls, and life support, and what is the business of these supposed space sites, uh, space stations? Um, 
We've got a whole program scheduled on our website. That's betterfutures.space. And with that, I'm just going to sign off and say, hey, have a great uh, have a great afternoon. Wherever you are in the world, we appreciate you being a part of it. Thanks a lot, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> All right. Stop recording. Recording stopped.